Good morning and welcome to the Board of Education's FY 2025 Operating Budget Work Session. Today we will begin the review of the Superintendent's FY 2025 Operating Budget Request. The order of review is reflected in the agenda, but I know that we will be doing chapters one through five today. Staff will provide an overview of the superintendent's recommended operating budget, followed by a review of budget by chapter. Our second work session will be held on Tuesday, January 23rd, 2024, beginning at 10 a.m. and will include a review of the remaining chapters of the superintendent's operating budget. If necessary, a third work session may be held on Tuesday, January 30th, 2024. In addition, the board will hold two hearings on January 18th, 2024 and January 25th, 2024 at 6 p.m. for the public to provide testimony. I would like to remind everyone that the board is scheduled to take tentative action on the operating budget at our board meeting on Tuesday, February 6, 2024. As we go through the budget chapters, I urge staff to point out pertinent issues that may be of concern to the board. As always, board members are free to ask questions at any point during the presentations and request staff to provide information on specific issues. I will now um, have my colleagues uh, introduce themselves starting with uh, Vice President Harris. Good, ap or good morning, everyone. Lynn Harris, I use she, her pronouns. Looking forward to today's conversation. Mrs. Wondrowski. Good morning, Rebecca Wondrowski, District 2. Mrs. Evans. Good morning, everyone. Shepra Evans, District 4. Ms. Wolf. Good morning, everyone. Brenda Wolf, District 5. Mr. Saeed. Good morning, everyone. Sammy Saeed, happy to be here on the snow day today. Ms. Yang. Good morning, everyone. And if I have seen you, haven't seen you yet, Happy New Year. And uh, glad to be here today. Ms. Rivera Oven. Good morning. Buenos dias. Uh, Grace Rivera Oven, representing District 1. Thank you. I think we have everyone. And I'd like to take a moment to introduce Shannon Pattyfoot, who is our new board senior analyst. Shannon, do you have any comments that you'd like to bring to the board uh, in relation to our budget? Thank you for introducing me. Happy to be here. So today uh, we're going to be focusing on chapters one through five. Chapter one is on schools. Chapter two, we'll be talking about school support and well-being. Chapter three, we'll be going over the budget for academics. We'll move on to chapter four, which is curriculum and well being. And then finally, chapter five is around special education. I'd like to ask the board to listen with the lens on what our current and projected enrollment dictates while making sure that we're understanding the needs of our English language learners and our special education students. There may be some questions around our increase in costs with the slight decrease in enrollment, so I want to make sure that we're understanding that. It's also important to note rising rates due to inflation and how that's impacting the district, most in categories such as our rising contract and utility cost. We'll be listening out for our finance team to tell us more about the totality of the ESSER grant, uh, what are the core items that we're asking to shift over to the operating budget, and what might be one-time expenses for FY25 versus what will become ongoing expenses in FY25 and beyond. Finally, an important component of this recommended budget is the fund balance. The total amount needed to cover all of the components in Dr. McKnight's budget is about $165 million, which includes our state, federal, and other revenue, as well as what currently remains in the fund balance. And then Carla, I'll pass that back to you. Thank you so much. Um, and now we uh, we will continue and get, to get us started, I pass it on to Dr. McKnight to give her opening remarks. Yes, so good morning, everyone. <clears throat> good to see you. And I am so glad that we are able to continue to have this work session despite the weather today and virtually. So thank you to the Board of Education for 
for arranging that in this way so that we could continue uh, our our plan and move forward with this very important conversation that we need to have about the operating budget. So uh, again, good morning, President Silvestri and members of the board. And today we are going to have our first work session around the recommended fiscal year 2025 operating budget for MCPS. Um, and as I <clears throat> just literally build some context before we get into the chapters, um, I just wanna remind us of a few things. When we think about the operating budget for our system, these, this budget really is the reflection of the most significant resource that is needed to be able to operate the largest district in the state of Maryland and the 14th largest district in the United States. And so as we think about what the needs are, we are often bringing forward um, how we have to address those needs to scale, considering that very important component. And, you know, we go through this process every year. And this year, I must say, I'm particularly grateful um, for the investments that the Board of Education requested last year and that the Montgomery County Council funded for the current fiscal year. And, you know, we're pleased to see that many of those investments that we were just here a year ago talking about are really starting to show results. We had a lot of conversation around what progress we needed to make in specific areas, focusing in on math and literacy. And again, you know, as we continue to talk about the importance of looking at the story that those investments tell, to how well they are working for the benefit of the students. That is the purpose of, of us diving deep into not just what are the investments, uh, what the investments are that we need, but most importantly, how we're going to be looking at the progress of those investments. And again, I just say I'm excited because a short year ago, we were here having this conversation and we're already starting to see some results of those investments that we were able to plan for and implement as of July 1. Um, and even according to our latest state assessment, more students in Montgomery County Public Schools in kindergarten through grade two are meeting or exceeding the benchmarks as of from fall 2023. I state that because that is a very important data point that we must be aware of. One of the things that we have identified as our priority when we came out of the pandemic was how are we going to continue to make progress after we had the setback of the pandemic. And here we are. And we know that when our students from kindergarten to grade two are actually meeting or exceeding benchmarks, then that means from the previous year, that means we're moving up and forward. And then again, that creates less gaps we're looking and, and, and looking to close and having discussion about closing as those students progress into their secondary um, career as an academic student. And, and even better, the greatest percentage increases uh, were for our students of color and students receiving free and reduced meals and special education services. So when we think about these being some of our specific service groups that we have intentionally planned those resources around and to be able to start seeing the beginning of progress, I'm excited about where we're gonna be able to continue to go given the investments that we're um, having discussion about now for our next fiscal year. So in these work sessions on the recommended operating budget, um, you know, I'm looking forward to our board members engaging in the conversation and asking specific questions about the various components of the uh, operating budget as uh, was previously shared. We will be covering chapters one through five today. So I know that's pretty lengthy, but we do look forward to getting into the conversation more deeply to make sure we're addressing the questions and thoughts that are out there. With an operating budget as large as ours, you know, we certainly anticipate and, and welcome questions because I think it's important for us to be as transparent and clear as possible about the intention of these investments as we have the conversations. So, you know, the recommended FY 2025 operating budget does total $3.3 billion, which is an increase of $157 million more than the current operating budget. And this does reflect a 4.97% increase for the FY25 budget. So those are the basis of what I wanted to share just to frame out our discussions and the continued discussions that we're going to have. Today we're having the um, first work session and then following that, we will have an opportunity to hear from our community in our hearings so that we can see what some of their reactions are and what some of their questions are um, in response to what we share in this first work session. So I look forward to those interactive opportunities and at this point, I'll turn it over to our Chief Operating Officer, Mr. Brian Hall, to provide um, an update about how we will go through this conversation today. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, one more thing I meant to mention. 
Um, I jumped right in talking about the budget, but I did want to say I'm also joined at the table. And here we are virtually. And while you can't see us at a table, I am here with uh, with our staff. And so we do have Mr. Hole and uh, as our COO and Dr. Betty Collins, the deputy superintendent, who are normally sitting at the table. They are here online with us virtually. And I'd also like to welcome our acting uh, chief of staff, Mr. Durso, who is also here with us today, along with the host of many other staff members who are here and prepared to have the discussion and engage in questions. So I wanna thank the staff for their participation in this work. Um, as I know, they have been a big part of helping to build out the vision of uh, this budget and where we need to go next as a system. Thank you again. Mr. Hall, I'll turn it over to you at this point. Great, thank you, Dr. McKnight. Um, and welcome uh, President Silvestre, members of the Board of Education, uh, and everyone joining us today on this snowy uh, month Tuesday uh, in Montgomery County. So we are really excited to be here today uh, in our first work session with the Board of Education. Uh, we actually started this budget process uh, back over the summer, not long after we finished uh, the last uh, budget session um, in, I guess it was June, and then shortly after that kicked this off. So uh, last year we did receive uh, the largest budget increase that we've ever received in Montgomery County. So I wanna thank our Board of Education and the County Council for their support uh, in in getting that uh, for our staff and our students and everything that they need. So we're excited to be here again today to kick off uh, our work with the Board of Education. Last year, uh, during these work sessions, uh, the board had some really good feedback for us and we actually made some uh, significant improvements to the budget, adding some really important supports around specifically math, uh, human resources, school safety, uh, and so we are you know, excited to begin this dialogue with the board uh, again this year. Um, one, a few of the things that we heard last year from the board um, was you know, a, a desire to actually see more detail than we provided last year, and this kind of goes along in the theme of transparency that we've been talking about ever since we started this process back in the fall. And so you are going to see a lot of detail on the slides today, uh, more than we had in there last year as we try to uh, adjust based on the um, you know, requests of, of, of our board members. And so uh, Mr. Riley is gonna kind of explain uh, how we're gonna walk through that, um, but it is a lot of information. And so we built in several uh, discussion breaks in the presentation so that we can you know, address questions as they come up instead of waiting till the end of the presentation. Of course, if there are additional questions as we work through that, we're happy to address those as well. Um, so uh, I'm gonna turn it over to our uh, Associate Superintendent of Finance, Mr. Rob Riley, to kind of talk about the run of show and, and get us started here. Um, and if we can pull up the PowerPoint, please. All right, actually, I guess I'm going through the first couple of slides here. So if we could go to the next slide, I'll, I'll get us kicked off before I turn it over to Mr. Riley. All right, so um, our budget for this current year, FY25, is uh, about $3.165 billion, which is the largest uh, budget of any uh, school district in the state of Maryland. That, of course, is because we are the largest district in the state of Maryland and the 14th largest in the entire country. Uh, so it is a very large budget. As I mentioned, we had a, a significant increase last year. Um, so this year, the request is for an additional $157.3 million. Uh, the vast majority of this, and we'll get into the details, but the vast majority, about $100 million of that, uh, is to pay for the second year of the negotiated contracts that we have with our three association partners uh, that we negotiated last year. So this year, uh, that equates to a 3% uh, pay increase plus steps for all staff who are eligible for that. Uh, that equates to about a 5% increase over last year. Uh, the increase that we are over the current year, excuse me. Uh, last year's budget increase was over 8%. And so this is a, a more modest request, although uh, still one that we believe will meet the needs of uh, the school system and the over 160,000 students that we that we serve every day. Next slide, please. So a, a few uh, of the key investments in our FY25 operating budget. Um, first one is to provide high quality education for a diverse student population. Uh, we know that we've got a very diverse uh, community in Montgomery County, a very diverse student body. 
that has very different needs uh, from one school to another, one classroom to another. And so making sure that we are providing that high quality education for every one of our students and really meeting our students uh, where they are and addressing the unique individual needs of each of our students. Uh, number two is the continued recovery from COVID-19. So uh, we all know uh, that COVID-19 was very disruptful to our society in general, but specifically to our, our young people and our education system. And even though, uh, and, and we'll get into this more as well, uh, this is the, the current year is the last year that we will have the significant uh, federal funds for COVID recovery. So we've got about $130 million of federal COVID recovery money budgeted this year that will not be there next year. And uh, we know that our students continue to recover from the pandemic, both socially, emotionally, and also academically. And so the challenge for us uh, as a school system and as a community is how do we continue that recovery without this uh, additional federal funding? So the next one is adding um, funding to the operating budget for things that were uh, previously budgeted on ESSER. So like I said, uh, this year we've got about $130 million of revenue uh, from ESSER. That's not gonna be there next year. We know that we can't bring all of that money over, um, but we have identified the really the key investments that we believe are uh, vital to maintain. And these are services directly to students, specifically around social emotional uh, well-being, things like social workers and counselors, and so we identified about 30 million, a little bit less than 30 million out of the 130 million that we thought absolutely critical to maintaining those services for our young people. And so uh, that is uh, a significant amount of the ask. Again, of the 100 and almost 60 million, about 100 million is for our uh, employee compensation packages, another 30 for uh, this ESSER money, uh, also referred to as the ESSER cliff something that, believe it or not, we've been talking about for almost four years now. So we all knew it was coming. That's not gonna make it any easier to uh, adjust for. Uh, and then fourth, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, competitive salaries and benefits for our employees, making sure that we remain competitive uh, with other school districts in the state of Maryland and around the country. And finally, uh, increased uh, cost of living. So we're all very aware uh, especially after the past several years um, about inflation and the significant uh, impact that that has both on our school system and on day-to-day uh, -day things like food and fuel and other uh, expenses. So I seem to be having a little uh, technical issues here. Can you hear me? Okay, great. So uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. And advance. So as I mentioned, we are the largest school system in the state of Maryland, which uh, means that we also have the largest budget in the state of Maryland. However, when you break that down on a per student basis, uh, we're really very competitive or, you know, kind of in the same ballpark as the ed other large school systems in the state of Maryland. Um, so we're funded at about $19,000 uh, per student per year. This is the state and the local funding does not include um, federal money. And you can see that that has been a you know pretty steady increase uh, since about 2016. Um, however, when you adjust for inflation, and as I mentioned earlier, we all think realize after the past several years coming out of COVID uh, that that really is the number that we need to be looking at is the inflation adjusted number because obviously uh, expenses go up every year, uh, salaries go up every year. And so the inflation adjusted really gives you a better sense of the district's purchasing power or what we're able to buy and provide for our students and our community. And as you can see, that is a very different picture. It's really been pretty flat. Um, we're actually just now uh, approaching, we haven't even quite reached uh, the funding level that we were at in 2009. And as I'm sure everyone uh, knows and realizes, a lot has changed uh, since 2009. So back, back then, people weren't talking about having social workers and psychologists in schools. That just wasn't as much of a need as it is today. And so as we continue uh, this recovery and addressing the uh, changing landscapes and the needs of our young people, 
uh, we really are literally doing more with less uh, than we've ever had to do before as we continue to provide the great educational experience for our children. We're also now providing um, a lot of support around food insecurity, social emotional needs, uh, and other things that um, you know are kind of new in the in the in the uh, you know uh, recent several years. And so, uh, as as we approach this budget year, just keeping in mind the fact that um, while the budget is large, it's very large, and we certainly uh, recognize that and appreciate um, you know uh, everything that goes into that. Just framing this in the sense that um, everything has gotten more expensive over the past many years, including the expenses of the school district. And so as we approach this budget, really looking at the key uh, drivers that we think are going to move the needle uh, for our students within the limited funding that we do have. If we could go to the next slide, please, I'll pass it over to Mr. Riley. Good morning, and uh, thank you, Mr. Hall, for providing an overview of the changes in our expenditures. I'm going to get into a little bit uh, further detail about that. And then as we move into the different chapters, uh, you're going to be seeing a lot more detail on each of those components of our expenditures. As for the revenues, because uh, our expenditures are an increase of 157.3, we have to have an equal amount of revenues uh, to create a balanced budget. So I'd like to thank Ms. Patty Fote for um, again uh, laying out some of those big ticket items that we're looking at this year. Uh, so the first item is local funding, and this is our request from the county. Um, and as was mentioned last year, we had the biggest uh, increase that we've ever had. Um, this year, the increase is uh, 165.7. Um, the next item there is fund balance change. So as Ms. Patty Fote mentioned, this is uh, going away. And as if you recall, if you recall from last year when we were doing the budget deliberations, uh, we were made aware of this by the county that this was one of the components that would go away. So this is the, the budget aspect of what that looks like in our budget. We're basically kind of losing that $25 million. And just to give everybody a heads up, this is new territory for us. Uh, we ha we've been using prior year fund balance to balance our subsequent year budget for at least the last 20 years, I think maybe even more. Um, to put it into some perspective too, we are the only uh, uh, LEA that is doing this, other, other than a few of the small LEAs uh, on the shore. Um, so what it, what it means from a accounting perspective is that during this year, we're going to be looking at our budget to actual, um, we always look, with it, look at it in very much detail, but even more in detail because we don't have, in, in essence, that $25 million was like our savings account. So we're going to go, we're going through this year without a savings account. Uh, next year, next item there is state revenue. So that's, this is an estimate that we've made based on the information we had at this time, and we're projecting an increase of $10 million here. Um, tomorrow, actually, the governor is going to uh, put forth his budget. So we'll know uh, uh, in general what that increase is going to be. And by this Friday, uh, it goes through MSDE and it goes through um, all the different uh, gyrations to see which what LEA gets what amount of increased funding. So we'll know by Friday what our actual increase is, but our estimate at this point is $10 million. Next item there is federal revenue. And just to make it clear, so ESSER is federal revenue, but we made the determination uh, you know, when it first started uh, a few years ago that we were not going to put ESSER in our operating budget. We were going to treat it as an outside source of funds. So this uh, federal revenue uh, really represents our title funds, uh, and that's the increase from 24 to 25 that we're uh, projecting for a Title I, for instance, grant. The next item there is enterprise and other revenue. Um, and for this, uh, it's mainly that increase there that you see of $5.6 million. It mainly is uh, related to our food and nutritional services fund. Um, and we will get into more detail about that later. Next slide, please. So here's a little more detail about the actual expenditure buckets that we that we uh, address when we go through our uh, budget work session. Um, just to give you an idea, as we go through each to each different chapter is going to go and speak to each of these individually when when it comes up in the chapter. So in, so for instance, I'm going to mention our SR shift that are moving to the operating budget. But when we get into the, each of the chapters, you're going to see exactly what those items were that did move there. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to walk through this just to give you an idea of what these changes were from last year. First one is enrollment changes. Um, and as Ms. Pattyfoe mentioned, uh, a couple of interesting things going on here with enrollment changes. So our uh, general enrollment and our uh, uh, projected actual and budgeted 
actually went down this year. Our enrollment for special ed and for EML went up. So you're seeing a slight dollar increase there of uh, $784,000. Um, so that's a combination of the decrease in general enrollment and then the increase in the other populations. Uh, also too, just uh, um, to share, that the, the amount is also a combination of how we implemented our class size guidelines. So our guidelines have not changed from last year to this year, but we did adjust the criteria for when we add a teacher, uh, when a grade or particular grade increases in enrollment. So that's part of enrollment changes. And that's, again, not, not too much change from last year. The next item is new class and additional space. And in that area, we're looking at, uh, we, we're adding a grade five at Cabin Ranch Middle School. And these are the equivalent uh, FTEs and the amount that's increased to a budget, to our budget uh, for that. There's also increased uh, uh, dollars for school plant operations, again, related to additional uh, school space. Next item, as Mr. Hall mentioned, was inflation, rate changes, realignments. Uh, and this, again, is another big area of our budget. Uh, it's 15 uh, point five million dollars, largely related to utilities, uh, increases in rate changes for our facilities, uh, transportation, materials management, bus fuel, and uh, a big component of that is our non-public placements, which is three point six million increase over last year. Grants and enterprise funds, as I mentioned before, uh, this is basically a wash when we're looking at revenues and expenditures. The grants and enterprise funds, by definition. Uh, the enterprise funds, the revenues uh, uh, equal the, uh, they're, they're responsible for their own revenues. So here you see a, uh, an increase in the $6.5 million that equates to the increase we saw in the revenue as well too. The next item is efficiency reductions. Uh, so this is, uh, this was a total of 8% reductions that we uh, tasked our different uh, chapters to come up with. Um, and it represents 56.6 FTEs as well as $14 million to, to, that is needed to help balance this budget. Continuing salaries and benefits, including health care. Um, these are the negotiated agreements that uh, came about from last year. Um, this is uh, the amount that's in for this year. It also includes uh, $20 million in uh, an increase for employee benefit plans. I had mentioned inflation and rate change. Uh, this, uh, actually our employee benefit plan, was hit by inflation probably uh, uh, more than any of the other items too. So that we're seeing large, large increases there in inflation. And that $20 million is an effort to, to forestall uh, that, that increase. Uh, next item, uh, an elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund or ESSER. Um, this is what was mentioned before. We have a total of $33 million coming from our ESSER into our operating budget. And this largely represents uh, a, a many social and emotional uh, components, such as our social workers, restorative justice positions, assist uh, psychologists, parent community coordinators. We also have assistant school administrators coming in from ESSER, as well as staff training, curriculum materials, and maintenance supplies. That's the, the big factors or big components of the uh, $33 million. And then finally, accelerators, including Blueprint for Maryland's Future. Um, so as noted, there, you're gonna see uh, details of this in the specific chapters. And for the mar majority, most of them you'll, you will be hearing about today because most of these do uh, reside in chapters one through five. Uh, the biggest component for Blueprint uh, is the, um, uh, what we're doing for pre-K expansion. And that's an increase of $8.2 million. And then for the other accelerators, we're looking at increases in our music program, which is 1.1 million, uh, compliance and investigation, which represents four new FTEs at a cost of 523,000, uh, increases in school leadership support, uh, which are three new directors, and that's a cost of 780K. Um, and then we are increasing our equity for schools. So if you recall, we have an equity fund, right now it's $20,000. But these are areas where uh, the independent activity fund or school activity funds may be inequitable in certain cases. So we want to make sure that there's opportunities for all students in all schools, um, regardless of how much money is in their student uh, activity funds. So we're adding $230,000 there, and that's going to be a $250,000 increase there. All these part of the accelerators, and as, as noted, all these you're going to be getting uh, a lot more detail as we go through the chapters.
next slide. If, if I could just interject quickly, Rob, um, with the accelerators, over $8 million of that is related directly to the blueprint for Maryland's future. And so uh, additional accelerators outside of that, and Rob mentioned a few of them, but they're very limited this year um, outside of what we're required to do uh, by the state of Maryland through the blueprint. Uh, and one of the other changes that we made, I mentioned adding more detail to the slides. One of the other changes we made uh, hearing feedback from the board last year was, and last year we did all the accelerators at the end. So we walked through the chapters and then did the accelerators. This year, uh, as we walk through the chapters, the accelerators are included on each of the slides there. And so we've just incorporated that all together, again, based on some of the feedback that we heard from the board last year. Thank you, Mr. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So we just want to give a little background on how this budget is created, um, and it, it's good budget practice to base it on a strategic plan, which is what we've been done, what we've been doing for the last few years. Uh, the strategic pillars of academic excellence, well-being, and family engagement, as well as professional and operational excellence. In addition to the uh, the board's priorities of improving math and literacy rates, building a safe and inclusive school climate supporting two-way communication between schools and families, as well as improving the recruitment, retention, and distribution of a highly qualified and diverse workforce. Um, next slide. So how do, how do we do this? Well, the way we gather input is we go to our community groups. So uh, next slide. And one of those groups is our superintendent's budget advisory group. Um, so th this group, this is the group made up of about 50 members uh, consisting of MCPS students employee association leadership, MCC PTA, and other employee, employee groups. And uh, to date, we've met uh, five times. Um, and we are actually gonna meet next week after the uh, work session. Um, and we use the, the superintendent's budget advisory group to gather input. The way we did it this year was in each of our sessions, we picked a particular uh, uh, budget pillar. Um, and then we, we we asked for their input. What what do they think would be a good uh, addition to increase academic excellence or to to make sure that we're uh, we have good amount of funds in our well being and family engagement as well as professional and operational excellence. And what you're looking at here is uh, the items that came up by consensus uh, from that group. Uh, first one being staffing and resources to build capacity. I'm not going to read the whole thing, uh, but staffing and resources. And that actually is, you know, as you know, our biggest component within our budget. Um, $90 million when you look at um, what we uh, what we do for uh, salaries as well as uh, uh, benefits. The next item there, tar targeting funds to the greatest academic needs and equitable allocation of our highest need school. Uh, this is an interesting one. We we talked about this um, in detail in our superintendent budget advisory committee. And as you know, we do differentiate when we do our resource allocation by formula. Um, there are a couple of components within our formula, one of them being consistency, one of them being transparency, um, one of the things being differentiation, and then finally flexibility. These are the four components. And one of the things that uh, came up, actually it came up out of our um, anti-racist action plan, was to look into the possibility of doing student-based budgeting. So to give you a broad overview, student-based budgeting is where the needs of the students are determined and then funding follows that. Um, so in other words, this is determined by principals. Principals have the autonomy to look at what the needs of their particular school are. And this is done through reaching out to their community. This is done through um, analysis of their SIF plans. And then they determine what their needs are. And then, uh, uh, Funding formula is created based on the students' needs. It's called student-based budgeting or um, weight budgeting. Um, there's a couple of different uh, terms, but this is something that we did decide we are going to pilot this. So I'm bringing it up here because you're not going to see this in any of the budget uh, slides or any of the budget chapters because there's no dollars associated with it. This year, as a pilot, uh, we're rolling it out and we're looking at uh, Watkins Mill Cluster to see what those what what it was going to look like student based budgeting there's a couple of different decision points it's going to be what flexibilities do we want to make available to principals to meet the needs of their school and their students another uh, item is what are those guardrails that we can't that you know by by law we can't have that flexibility at the at the principal level we have to um, do do those things from the central office so um, uh, an exciting area that we're going into just to give you the, the timeline of it so right now 
uh, again, I said no, no budgeted funds were allotted here. What we're looking at during this pilot is to evaluate what were, what are those flexibilities and what are those guardrails needed in place. So that's the pilot. It's going to uh, upon evaluation, we plan on doing uh, more schools in the subsequent year, and at that point, we may look at uh, increasing funding. Um, you know, to, to go towards this student-based budgeting model. Finally, if, if it's determined that this is effective for MCPS, we would go uh, into a full school student-based mod model, uh, but that would be uh, three to four years away. Next item is uh, well-being and family engagement. And Budget Advisory Committee here also had a lot of great input. Uh, the top item there is early childhood education to meet the needs of youngest learners. Um, this, as Mr. Hull mentioned, this is the majority of our blueprint increase that we have put forth, um, $8.2 million. Uh, proactively and culturally and linguistically appropriate engagement. Uh, this we have as an accelerator too. Uh, one, of, one of the items is we are, we realize that uh, we need additional funding in our language line. That's one of the areas that we are addressing this concern. Um, next one, supporting students with mental health and substance abuse challenges. Uh, as noted, a lot of the items that we are bringing back from ESSER directly relates to this area. And then finally, uh, engaging families and communities more in school level decision making. Um, that one actually, as I just mentioned, uh, there could be a component there with student based budgeting because there is a lot of uh, um, community input there at the school level as well, too. The final, final uh, category, professional and operational excellence, uh, system-wide professional and leadership, professional leadership development. Uh, that, a big component of ESSER, is coming back into the operating budget to address that. And then recruitment and retention. So uh, as noted, that is actually the largest uh, part of our budget uh, in salaries and benefits. Um, so that, that's our input from our superintendent's budget advisory committee. I'm now going to uh, pass it off to our um, Director of Management and Budget, Ms. Yvonne Alfonso Windsor, and she's going to go uh, over what we learned from our uh, meetings in our community forums. Uh, Mr. Riley, real quick, before you move on, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Yeah, so as you know, I have a lot of interest in the student-based budgeting that you were just talking about. Uh, I think it's something I've heard day in and day out, every single school I go to, that that is really the need of students. Can you walk me through what you're saying uh, this upcoming year, you're going to be looking at the Watkins Mill cluster to kind of look at first steps for this program. Can you walk us through what exactly that's going to look like? What are you going to be doing in the Watkins Mill cluster um, this upcoming school year and, you know, how that's going to work? Sure. So so there's two, com when I mentioned student-based budgeting, there's two components. What you want to do first is look at needs within the schools and and principals can look at what, what can they, what's in their control um, that they can do to increase that uh you know, student outcomes. The other part is funding. So, you know, we, we engage in this pilot and due to the timing, you know, when, when it's occurring, there's really no time to uh, uh, add additional funding and, and kind of flow that through our channels, like, like we were saying with our uh, community input. So this year, what we're doing is testing the flexibilities as well as the guardrails. So, uh, uh, Mr. Say, what that means is flexibilities. Uh, a teacher might say, hey, can I trade this particular position for another position. And we, to, to some extent, we already do that. So this is taking it a step further. What are some of those other flexibilities that principals can use um, to make student outcomes improve? So uh, one of the things we have to be aware of, and, hus and hence the term guardrails, is what are our state requirements? What's in Comar that we cannot afford or, or offer as a flexibility? Um, also, uh, you know, what's, what's our... Um, yeah, by law, you know, what can't we do? So in this in this pilot, we do want to kind of leave it open to kind of see what ideas are out there. Um, but that that's the purpose of this pilot. So what's going to happen is we're going to determine at the end of this pilot, what were those best practices? What's something that we can improve, improve as we roll out to another set of, an, an, a larger set of uh, clusters of schools um, to see, you know, what, what how can we implement what was determined in this pilot to next year and if additional funding is required. So from a budget perspective, from, from a um, you know budget request perspective, we might have schools um, asking for certain amounts of money in order to uh, incorporate these changes that are in the student-based budgeting model. That was kind of crazy, Sammy, but does that, uh, does that answer? So that's where we're at. Yeah, so kind of what I'm hearing is this year, we're just gonna be kind of asking principals and looking at, okay, what 
what would you want to change? What are those flexibilities? And then look at after that, what can we change and what can't we? And then after that, the next year, we're going to look at implementation of those ideas that principals and community members kind of gave to us. Perfect. Yep. That, okay. That's exactly where we're at right now with it. Perfect. I see Brenda has her hand up. Uh, Ms. Wolf. You have to get off mute. <laughs> I, I'm kind of interested in the increase, enrollment increases you're seeing in special ed and EML, I guess what I want to know is what do you think is driving that? Because, you know, I'm always concerned about disproportionality in special ed. And I'm also concerned that with regard to our EMLs, that it's not language that's driving them into special ed. So is, is, am I able to get information as to which schools you're seeing the enrollment increases in special ed broken down by race and ethnicity? Yeah, I think we can provide that. And I missed, uh, I, Diana Wiles is on the call. I think she can provide a little more detail of why we're seeing those particular increases. Good morning. Um, so part of the what we're seeing in special education is a significant increase for our earliest learners, our infants and toddlers. Um, Likely what it is, is we're seeing the kids that didn't get services early on due to the COVID closures. Um, these are students who are now kindergartners who may have needed speech and language or occupational therapy um, and other services that because of the closures, um, they didn't get them during that time. Um, and they were not as ready as some uh, as we would have liked them to be to enter school. Um, we are looking at the uh, that specific question that you asked on disproportionality related to students who are EML. And so that's the work that we're doing in our Rose Grant that we're continuing to uh, roll out over this school year. Well, when I talk about disproportionality, I'm talking about the EMLs with the question I asked. But I'm also talking about Black students and Black males. And, and actually, we're seeing a lot of issues with our young ladies too. So if I could get that information, I would appreciate it. I also had a question about um, pre-K. Um, now, am I misunderstanding? Are we adding seats for special ed pre-K for half day instead of full day? We're growing at the same rate as the um, general education side. And so, I think in the beginning of the rollout of Blueprint and increasing general education pre-K, there was some growth um, that didn't happen on the special education side. So we are playing catch up in some ways. Um, we tried to remedy that this year. We may have some classes that still need to go full day. Um, but the other piece to that is special education will likely always have some half day classes because of the needs of students who some of our three and four year olds just may not be ready to go for uh, a full day of school. But in our overall plan, as we grow our general education pre-K classes, we're also growing the pre-K self-contained special education classes at the same time and in the same locations. Yeah, I, I, I was just concerned because, you know, we hear from our public all the time that half day classes are a problem. And I do know that some of our special needs students just cannot accommodate full day, but I, I wanted to be sure that we're adding something that's valuable and not just putting in something to sort of address the, the question, but that we're actually going to be able to move them along this way. I think Ms. Rebetta Oven had her hand up next, and then Ms. Harris. Mute. Thank you. Um, just to piggyback on my colleague, on Mrs. Wolf's question. So the so the answer then is yes to the special ed half a day, because you said because some of the kids are not ready to to go all day for pre K. Correct. It's both. So okay. in the in the plan that um, has been developed, we are adding additional full day special education classes at the same rate and at the same time as general education is adding them, but we're also keeping where we need to 
half day classes with students based on what their needs are, where students can only go half day. Can you clarify for me then uh, transportation for those kids? Is transportation then for the half a day pre-K kids fully provided? Right. We do provide transportation for half day uh, for students who are pre-K special education um, and re receive those services half day. Yes, we do. Okay. And then my, um, so, so um, I know last, last week, uh, so last week was, was it this week? Last week. Thanks. Just last week of the session, I did ask for the data, the breakdown data on our EML kids and the representation of EML kids and the increase in special education um, by, by region and where we were seeing that growth. Because my question was, how much of a growth have we seen in the EML population in the special education component? And when we're, we're looking at a data, now it kind of makes more sense what you said, that we probably did not identify them early enough because we saw more of a representation in the later years in elementary school for EML, uh, for the EML kids. Um, so not exactly. I don't, I don't, I haven't teased that data out what I was saying is specifically for the enrollment growth that we're seeing. We are seeing a lot of it for our students who are entering school because these are students that would have received services. So if you look at our data <clears throat> during COVID and post COVID, we saw a decline in students that were getting infants and toddler services. Um, and so, but we saw an increase of students who need the services as we started to re-enter school. And so many of the students that we would have been able to provide services earlier to, who have would have entered kindergarten more ready, we're now playing catch up because they didn't get the services in infants and toddlers. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. And But you'll be able to then provide us with the data of what's, what that growth is. Sure. And if it in geographic areas of this across the board. Sure, absolutely. Okay. Um, I don't know if this is a good time for me to ask the question about the lunch aids. There, I, I just, somebody just on, um, is this a good time to ask about that? I'm, I'm not sure, but there was a significant, I think, decrease in the, in, in, um, in the budget for the, especially in elementary school. Mr. And Rock, will I, you be getting to that later on? I just want to make sure we get to it some sometime. Yeah, and I apologize. The uh, I should have uh, opened it up for discussion. We do have a couple more introductory slides. Um, okay. It's okay if we just kind of go through them. Um, yeah. And then yeah, we. Uh, yeah, I wasn't sure. Thank you. Oh no problem. So I, I'll, I'll push it back to Ms. Alfonso Windsor to go over uh, what we heard from our uh, budget forums this year. Thank you and good morning. Um, so this year we held, um, in addition to the budget advisory committee forums, we also held five community forums in in uh, different um, platforms, virtual and in person. In Next addition, slide. one of those uh, community forums was also a uh, student uh, is leadership from middle schools and and, and high schools uh, that were able to provide feedback. And we also held a field feed Facebook Live completely in Spanish, you know, for our uh, Spanish population. Um, so through those community budget forums, really the, the, the themes were consistent uh, uh, throughout. And um, we also broke it out between the three pillars of our strategic plan, academic excellence, well-being and family engagement and professional operational excellence. Uh, through academic excellence, uh, they were asking for more opportunities, language opportunities, advanced placement classes, as well as uh, financial literacy courses and additional funding for extracurricular activities. Um, the well-being and family engagement uh, was similar to what we uh, heard. Yvonne, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um... oh no, I'm so I apologize. I've got it now. Sorry about that. Sorry, no problem. Um, so the well-being and family engagement was similar to what uh, Mr. Riley referred to when he came to the uh, budget advisory committee. Is that increase for mental health supports? counselors, psychologists, social workers. Um, there were also requests for expand security uh, training and also preventative measures uh, for those security and safety protocols, uh, not just additional investments in, in security. Um, 
And then in terms of professional and operational excellence, uh, there was some discussion about improved Wi-Fi connection across the district and concerns for uh, with the cost of transportation for magnet schools. And this all came as a result. Uh, we looked through the lens of what can we continue doing, what can we improve, and what we can stop. And that's why uh, that's why you see some of the themes uh, listed here. Uh, next slide. So as you all know, we are going to be looking uh, or going over chapters one through four through five today uh, at this work session, and we're doing things a little bit different. And I just want to go over that uh, really quickly. In chapter one, it's really uh, list all the funding that we have that is school-based. It goes over our K-12, EML, uh, Montgomery Virtual Academy, Pre-K, Head Start, Title I, and Special Education. And then in the past, we have done Chapter 5, which is the other part of a special education uh, later. But today, we're going to do it right after the Chapter 1 is school-based resources for special education. We're going to go into those non-school-based direct supports to students for special education and the central office supports. Um, so from chapter one, we're gonna go through chapter five and then we'll do chapter two, a school support and well-being, chapter three, academics, and chapter four, curriculum and instructional programs. And we're hoping that by doing this, we, we provide an overview of all the special education services um, that, that we provide to our students. Uh, next slide. And then as you know, next, next week on uh, January 23rd, we're gonna go through chapters six through 11. Um, and now before I turn it over to, we start the chapters and I turn it over to Dr. Laverne Kimball, uh, Acting Chief of Schools, uh, we're gonna take a, a pause uh, in case there are any questions over to, uh, in regard to the overview. Yeah, any any questions um, in in specific to the overview slides? Again, we're going to go into details for each chapter. So, um, Ms. Harris, do you have any questions for the overview? Uh, yes, just briefly, and this builds off of uh, Ms. Wolf's initial question. Um, I noticed in the budget and brief book in the inflationary section, it one of the areas it mentioned uh, we were seeing significant inflationary pressures were in contractual services, and then. We are seeing significant increases in contractual services in several areas, particularly special education and curriculum. And so uh, building on uh, Ms. Weil's answer to Ms. Wolf's initial question, where we're seeing a lot of, of students now in kindergarten who didn't receive early infants and toddler supports, speech therapy, um, occupational therapy, that kind of thing. I'm going to be very interested as we get into the special education chapter to see if that is what is responsible for the almost doubling of contractual services from this year's budget to next year's budget in special education um, is to to provide the services that students did not receive when they were younger uh, to to support them as they are entering kindergarten. So more a comment than a question. I think. So we'll we'll dive into that in the special ed section. Okay. If there are no other further questions on the overview, let's begin. Mr. Riley or Mr. Holt? Uh, can we bring up the slideshow and then I'll pass it on to Dr. Kimball. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good afternoon, President Silvestri, Vice President Harris, members of the board, and Dr. McKnight. Um, as Ms. Windsor said, I'm Laverne Kimball, and I'm the Acting Chief in the Office of School Support and Wellbeing, and I'm pleased to share the superintendent's recommended FY25 operating budget for Chapter 1, our schools, K-12. to So, as we all know, the school's are a microcosm of society. And we know that our schools today aren't the schools of yesteryear. Um, society has experienced a lot of changes and we see those changes uh, reflected and played out in our schools every day. So our students' academic needs, their social, emotional, behavioral needs, we know were exacerbated during the pandemic. And while the federal government has said that COVID has ended, we know that the vestiges remain. So with any crisis, our students and families who are most negatively impacted by poverty suffered the most. 
And for some that included a loss of family and friends, uh, food insecurity and other related social determinants of health. And so those things clearly are difficult to get over. However, as a school system, we are resolved to make a difference. As we look at the more than 160,000 students that we are honored to serve, we note the diversity that we have. Um, our diversity is our strength. We're diverse with regards to race, culture, ethnicity, language, um, socioeconomic status. And while we celebrate that diversity, um, we have to recognize that we have inequitable outcomes. And those there are significant disparities in performance between um, students and um, different uh, racial and ethnic groups, uh, different uh, cultures, and the disparities fall most heavily on our Hispanic Latino students and our Black and African American students, as well as our emerging multilingual learners and our students impacted by poverty. Um, as the anti-racist audit indicates, we know that uh, to become an anti-racist system, we have to be coherent with our work, uh, build relational trust, and continuously uh, collect data and provide equity-centered uh, capacity building. So foundational to the budget is our ability to implement successful practices. And in chapter one, um, the chapter is largely an investment in personnel and funds, um, the instructional program in each of our schools, and that's including then a large array of professional as well as support positions. Um, given those immense challenges that uh, staff face, we have to continue to provide con competitive salaries um, to recruit and retain the best of the brightest, best and the brightest, and um, such as a 3% increase in compensation that Mr. Hull mentioned earlier for eligible staff in FY25. Uh, while we are not where we need to be, we need to continue to build on some of the gains that we have. And Dr. McKnight shared some of these gains at the outset. We, uh, have key investments then at the elementary level. And we're seeing differences as we implement the science of reading in kindergarten through grade two. When we look at our, when we compare our fall 2004 data to fall um, 2023, there's an overall increase of 4.2 um, gain percentage points on our doubles. And we know that that investment is largely attributed to the teacher training and the science of reading. Um, what is wonderful also is that those gains are across all of our racial groups. And the largest gains, though, are with our Hispanic and Latino students. Um, we also, uh, with regards to that assessment, are seeing gains with our student service groups. And of course, we want to continue to invest so that uh, we can continue that positive trajectory. When we look at our middle schools, we recognize the importance of um, investments in terms of having opportunities um, for students to take algebra um, by grade nine. We recognize the importance also of having culturally relevant instruction um, for students in literacy and in math. And as we look at the high school level, um, some of the um, investments that we've seen so far, um, we're very pleased that currently we have 25,830 high school students enrolled in at least one AP or IB course. And thanks to uh, your funding of the equity enhancements in the F FY24 budget, all of the AP and IB exams are free. So clearly free 99 is a good thing. 
And as we uh, look at um, other investments, um, we can see that in conjunction with our partners at uh, Montgomery College, um, during FY 2023, we had uh, 1,713 students who were dually enrolled. Um, in 2023, we had 238 graduates um, who received their associate's degree. And currently, we are on track for 303 students um, to receive their associate's degree upon graduating from high school. Um, clearly, those are great things to celebrate um, and to build on. With regards to uh, careers, we know that we have uh, over 16,000 students who are enrolled in career and technology coursework. And we also have more than 3,000 students uh, who are enrolled in internships and apprenticeships. Quick Clearly. Question, Dr. Kemp, um, the position salaries is teachers and other salaries is everybody else, is that correct? No, those are all of the salaries. And I'm going to go over that in a second. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, and I'm winding up uh, just to, just an overview. Um, so as we look at our staffing, um, as we look at our successes and we look at the budget and, and all in um, chapter one, two, we see that we have uh, an unprecedented amount of supports that are enhancing our students' mental health and well-being in terms of staff who are in our schools. Uh, you heard Mr. Raleigh mention earlier in terms of, of staffing that we know that if we're going to receive optimal, equitable educational outcomes, we have to deploy our resources effectively. And so he referenced then the four principles that we really honor. And these are really critical in terms of being consistent. The schools who are similar then have similar allocations. Uh, we differentiate though um, in terms of looking at where we have students with the greatest needs. At the same time, we have flexibility then for our school leaders in terms of allocating the resources to meet students' needs. And we are very transparent about our resources. So as we look at this first slide, we see then that these are the funds that are budgeted for elementary, middle, and high school. And this does not include the funds for pre-kindergarten, nor for Head Start alternative programs, uh, ESAW, Montgomery Virtual Academy, or for special education. And later in uh, chapter one, those specific areas are going to uh, be addressed. As we look at this, you can see that the overwhelming amount of money goes to um, fund staff $1.2 billion then for um, positions and other salaries, 67.5 million. Um, we also, this, Section also includes uh, less than 1% of this money is going towards um, contact contractual services, such as you see our system wide data tool. We have um, performance matters that our um, schools use so that they can um, have uh, data to determine exactly real time data to see where our students are. This also includes uh, uh, contractual funds in terms of music equipment, um, sports officials, et cetera. And um, also we have money here for supplies and materials, that's $30.9 million, um, as well as a small percentage of money, 1% that goes towards um, other areas. And, all of these things, the dual enrollment, the AP, IB exam fees, as I mentioned earlier, those are clearly um, some of our equity initiatives that really help us then to level the playing field. 
Additionally, in that uh, group of others, we have things such as um, commencement, um, money that goes towards um, our various venues for when we um, conduct um, commencement exercises. Next slide, please. As we look at um, this slide, um, at the outset of the presentation, uh, Mr. Hull and Mr. Riley referenced the projected changes in enrollment for FY25 and how this will impact our total positions. Um, so for K through 12, the actual enrollment from September to September 22 to September 23 decrease by 568 students. And the projected and budgeted enrollment um, for FY24 is for 160,070 students. And that's uh, 1,788 more students than we actually had um, by September 30th. Also, in terms of the uh, for the um, projected enrollment for FY25, the projected enrollment is 159,135 students, which results in a decrease of 935 students, and that's budget to budget. Um, so as a result of the projected enrollment decrease from budget to budget, there was a decrease of 46 position. So here you can see these, the way that this plays out though, at both the elementary level, at the middle school level, and at the high school level. So here we had a loss, elementary uh, level, a, a total loss, of 102.7 uh, positions at the middle school level, 22.7, and at the high school, 45.7. With um, at the uh, elementary level, we see that decrease of 683, and in middle school, we have an increase though of 105 middle school students, but there's a net change reduction. As we look at high school, there's a decrease of 192 high school net, uh, students, but with a net change increase um, of about 0.2 million. Also, we have seen enrollment growth at uh, Thomas Edison High School of Technology and um, that has required an increase of $39,991. Next slide, please. As we look at um, significant budget changes, uh, you heard Mr. Riley mention earlier that we um, have funding then for Cabin Branch Elementary School. As you know, when our schools, elementary schools open, they are for grades K to four. And now in the next uh, fiscal year, in FY 2025, we will be opening um, grade five. And so uh, with grade five, uh, this includes 4.6 positions um, that are going to be added. So there's funding that's added to a number of positions, of course, that already exist in the school. Additional, uh, for example, additional art, music, and PE uh, money, um, additional monies going towards paraeducators, lunch hour aides to uh, cover then grade fives, grade five. And also, um, we have uh, for textbooks, media center, and instructional materials. That's a decrease because that's a non-recurring cost with opening a new school. Next slide, please. As we look at realignments um, within uh, chapter one, we know the uh, realignments are budget neutral. 
Um, we have one realignment uh, for Seneca Valley High School's career program where we have $74,342 that, that is going uh, from funding a 1.0 resource teacher uh, position and 60,204 from professional part-time salaries to realign that in order to create a coordinator uh, position for that program. Next slide. Um, as we look at other uh, reductions, we are reducing um, funds, um, 2.3, million for textbooks, media center, and instructional materials. And this will not have an impact on teaching. And we do not anticipate an impact on teaching and learning because these reductions are uh, consistent with trends that uh, we have analyzed. Next slide, please. In this slide, you can see that uh, we are uh, referencing that uh, much anticipated, much dreaded Esser Cliff. Um, these are areas that um, we shifted from Esser to the operating budget, um, including then elementary and middle school curriculum, also funds for Chromebook repair, as well as um, administrative support for our single administrator elementary schools. And um, with regards to that administrative report um, support, um, that is for five assistant school administrator positions and two fully released teacher positions in our smallest elementary schools. I'm clearly recognizing that even for those schools that have low enrollment um, in elementary school, that nonetheless, two administrators are absolutely critical. When we look at all of the challenges and all that our schools face uh, these days, it definitely is not a, a luxury, it's a necessity. As we look at accelerators. So how do we really focus on uh, promoting equity? We have uh, several areas that we want to address where we want to ensure that students have opportunities to uh, benefit from enrichment, um, such as with band and orchestra instruments. We have money designated um, over a million dollars for repairing and replacing instruments. And that's for students um, across all three levels, elementary, middle, and high. Also, we've designated $230,000 to serve as an equity fund. And while we know that our schools have independent activity funds, certainly um, those funds are not created equal. And oftentimes schools may use their independent activity funds to fund um, school trips, um, excuse me, field trips um, for students who um, don't have the funds to do so. Um, this equity fund is another uh, source of revenue to tap. And finally, in terms of an accelerator, um, $150,000 of, of seed money has been put aside for uh, renaming. And this is consistent with uh, a policy that uh, the system has related to naming school facilities. And in um, 2019, under uh, previous superintendent there, uh, we found there was a, a group of students who um, at one of the local colleges who did uh, research on current and future names of, of schools. And it's recognizing that in Montgomery County, we um, name schools then uh, based on people who have uh, contributed to the community, the county or the nation. And, um, with the research that was done, we found out that there were uh, schools that 
had had previous uh, slave owners. And consistent with um, our policy now, communities have an opportunity to engage with the school community to determine whether or not they want to look at renaming the school. So this $150,000 um, is something if someone um, chooses to uh, go down that road, um, this could help fund things such as uniforms and, and stationaries. Next slide, please. This slide, as I said at the outset, uh, did, the previous slide did not include um, alternative education programs. So here we see then $4.7 million um, that is here for our alternative education programs. Um, we know that uh, some of our students have social, um, emotional, behavioral issues that exceed their um, about their capacity to be successful in the uh, generally at a uh, comprehensive program and they may need a smaller setting. And so for those students, you can see here with um, in the alternative program that 96% goes towards salary and wages. Uh, there are also uh, contractual services that uh, go to about 2% of that 4.7 million goes towards social and emotional learning and mentoring, tutoring, um, other student support services. Um, then we also have 1% uh, that's going towards supplies and uh, materials and just under 1% for um, other um, funds and equipment. Next slide, please. In this slide, um, we have um, um, Title I, Part D, Neglected Delinquent and At-Risk Youth Program Grant. And uh, here, there's going to be a decrease of 32510 um, in terms of reductions in part-time salaries um, contractual services and associated employee benefits. And at this time, um, the we will go through the rest of chapter one. Uh, my colleagues are going to continue with the presentation um, as we build on the mission that every student will have the academic creative problem solving and social emotional skills to be successful in college and career. The next slide for that. Good morning, President Silvestri, members of the board, uh, Dr. McKnight and the community. My name is Tamara Hewlett. I am the director of the Department of English Learners and Multilingual Education. Uh, as we discussed at our last board meeting, the emergent multilingual learner population continues to be the fastest growing population of students receiving services. You were able to hear a little bit about the programming needs and areas of success and growth of our program. As such, you will see an a request for an increase in our English language development teaching staff. With the proposed budget, you will see that we will have uh, salaries and rate wages that include a total of about 892 full-time equivalent positions uh, with a total breakdown of 851 of those positions being English language development teachers. 19 of those positions will serve as resource teachers in our high schools. And um, we will have about 11 and a half uh, ELD para educator positions. The other um, uh, 50,000 um, that you see on the screen is, is reflected for substitute salary. So whenever we, we require substitutes, we use that fund um, to provide substitute salaries. Next slide, please. 
So in looking at our enrollment data, we continue to see the rapid growth of our EMLs, uh, our emerging multilingual learners. And uh, we are really seeing an increase in grades six through 12. Uh, we have requested an additional 35 ELD teaching positions in response to this continued growth and two resource teacher positions for Northwest and Blake High Schools because their programs continue to grow um, and require additional ELD teachers, which requires the role of the resource teacher as well. We're also proposing a realignment of 26.6 ELD paraeducator positions. Uh, that would increase the ELD teaching positions by an additional 16.8 FTEs. Uh, I want to be clear that this realignment of these positions are not positions that have current paraeducators in them. We've used uh, the ELD paraeducators in our, we use them in our secondary SLIFE programs over the years, and we will continue to do so. We've also converted some of these positions in the past in order to support uh, the need for an increase in teachers um, that we see occurring in the second half of the school year. So this realignment is an effort to solidify the need for these ELD teaching positions and provide more accuracy and transparency in our budget around our staffing. I will now hand it over to Dr. Peter Moran, who will review the budget for the Maryland Virtual Academy. Thank you very much, Tamara. So good morning. My name is Peter Moran. I am a uh, associate superintendent in the Office of School Support and Wellbeing. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to discuss an important element of the FY 2025 MCPS budget in an initiative that has played an increasingly significant role in meeting the evolving needs of students as an outcome of the pandemic. The Montgomery Virtual Academy was established in FY 2022 to support students and families who needed or elected to have access to virtual learning following our first uh, full return to in-person learning during the 2022-2023 school year. The initial funding source for the MVA was from ESSER and continued through FY23 and FY24. As you are aware, the program initially supported students in kindergarten through grade 12, but has now transitioned over the past year to a grade two to grade 12 program. As demonstrated on this slide, 100% of the $4.3 million 2025 budget is designated for the salaries and wages of staff. These staffing allocations accumulate to 52.2 uh, FTE. It is important to note the increase of 97, uh, 976,000 um, or an increase of approximately 30% in dollars from the FY 2024 budget to the FY 2025 budget. While the overall projected budget for MVA is decreasing, an increase in the main budget has been required in the form of the proposed budget shift from ESSER to local, um, which is approximately 1 million, including benefits to support 12.8 positions. Additionally, some of the enrollment-based positions will be continued to be supported through the K uh, through 12 budget. If you go to the next slide, please. In order to meet the expenditure requirements and program uh, priorities, this slide demonstrates realignments that were made in the form of one ANS position, 1.8 FTE and supporting services positions, and 9.2 teacher and other professional positions. These realignments resulted in a net change of $3,250. Next slide, please. So these expenditure shifts were the result of, the, of again, the non-renewal of the ESSER grant. The positions described below were converted to the operating budget and account for a total of $724,000 uh, and 11.8 positions. And if we could go to the next slide, please. I'm now going to kick it over to, I believe, Nichelle Owens to talk about Title I. Thank you so much, Dr. Moran. Good afternoon. My name is Nichelle Owens, and I serve as the Director for the Division of Early Childhood, Title I, and Recovery Funds. Using federal, state, and local funding, the mission of our division is to promote school readiness, achievement, and wellness by providing a customized and comprehensive support through collaboration and advocacy 
with schools, families, and community partnerships. Our goal is to ensure access to equitable, high-quality learning opportunities and resources for all students whom we serve. On this slide, salaries and wages show the amount of funding that goes directly to schools. And these uh, funds going directly to schools go by way of local, state, and federal funding. Thinking about the Title I grant, it currently provides supplemental funding to 45 Title I schools with free and reduced price meals rates that are 69.06% and higher. These 45 schools include one learning center, five middle schools, and 39 elementary schools. Our Title I schools use these funds for additional classroom support, focus support, and coaching uh, positions for teachers. Our Title I school-based positions that are above and beyond what MCPS allocates through local funds also are used to support focused paraeducators and school-based parent community coordinators. Shifting gears to pre-K, pre-K and Head Start teacher salaries are also included on this slide. A combination of local, state, and federal funds cover the cost of pre-K staff in our schools. This year, we have 1,951 full-day pre-K Head Start seats, and we are nearly 97% filled for those pre-K seats, those full-day seats. Our part-day seats are about 90% filled, but it's very clear that the full-day seats were the preference as they filled up uh, pretty early in uh, the registration process. So as we look in uh, FY25, and we also consider our alignment with the blueprint, Pillar 1, these funds also represent a conversion and creation of 26 full-day pre-K classes. This means that we will see a reduction in the number of part-day seats and an increase in the number of full-day seats. The need for more, more full-day pre-K is noted, and it is proven to support our school readiness. And we're seeing some results. In FY24, more full-day seats were created, and we see a small increase in the percentage of students demonstrating readiness on the KRA. We're also seeing a smaller percentage of students at the emerging readiness level on the KRA. Pre preparing for kindergarten readiness includes classroom academic support through professional development and coaching. It also includes social emotional learning to support students with self-regulation and their social foundations. In addition, our office provides wraparound supports for families. Next slide, please. As we look at this slide, it simply represents the salary increases for staff assigned to Head Start classes and those who are on the Head Start grant. At this point, I will pass the presentation on to our Associate Superintendent in the Office of Special Education Services, Ms. Diana Watts. Diana? In, I'm sorry, Ms. Wilds. Before we do that, can we just take a break here uh, to answer any questions that the board members may have before we continue? Thank you. Uh, please put your uh, electronic hand up, but I'll start with Ms. Yang and then Ms. Rivera. Thank you, Ms. Need to unmute first. Good morning again, everyone. Uh, I have a few uh, questions that need some uh, data assistance from you. Um, I would try. I would like to have some number to uh, that tell me uh, how many schools we still have only one administrator, like one principal, uh, 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 or um, uh, if we have any. Uh, so I see that we have moved some from ESSER to some schools. I wonder whether there's still schools out there with a single administrator. Um, second thing, I would like some data to help me understand. Um, we have professionals um, certified 
professionals in our school buildings at all three levels, elementary school, middle school, and high school. I would like to have uh, data on how many of our certified professionals in our buildings that do not have students that assign to them. They have, they have their task, they have a job duty, but they do not have students assigned to them uh, at different level and what those positions are. I would like, and the number of those staff, I would like to have uh, uh, overall understanding. Uh, number three, uh, I see that in the elementary school level, we are decreasing three counselors. I understand this is enrollment driven. However, we have heard from our communities, um, our parents, and we have heard from our school staff that uh, a single counselor in our students at elementary school level is uh, a, a difficult to manage, especially our 504 plans have increased 65%, right? From the 5,400 cases in 2019 to 8,953 cases this year. So, um, and the ratio, if I'm looking at for our elementary school now, I understand that this year we have four elementary schools with enrollment of 600 that have only one school counselor. So I'm tr trying to understand uh, why we are eliminating positions uh, at the elementary school level for counselors. Um, um, you can get back to me. And number four, uh, question four is about content specialists. This is a question specifically for virtual academy. Mm, our virtual academy, um, <clears throat> it's an important program, serve about uh, 800 or, or close to 900, eight to 900 students this year. It has five content specialist position. Um, I understand we have content specialists at different school levels, but for our other schools, you know, maybe just a couple in, in different subject area and different school level. I'm trying to understand uh, this staffing allocation. Thank you. All right, well, that was a lot. Um, if I always like to avoid um, a lot of follow-ups because it becomes very burdensome on the staff. So if any of those could be answered here today, that would be much appreciated. Um, if the school oh, administrator yes, wants- I'm trying to, oh, I'm sorry. I can uh, answer I, the school administrator. I can, one. yeah. Uh, we do have two elementary schools that do will not have a second administrator next year, um, and but they will have fully released classroom teacher to provide administrative support. Um, and I will let uh, special ed speak to any special education uh, special schools that have one administrator. And before we move to special education, I just wanted to uh, double down a little bit on the background, Ms. Yang, on that the Board of Education and myself, you know, we work with the uh, associations to do two things. One, acknowledge that given the needs after the pandemic, academic, social, emotional support, that every school needed to be able to have someone in addition to the principal. We've also been thoughtful about how we manage that priority, that priority through the budget. So each year we've tried, we, you know, we've added on um, those administrators who would be able to serve as full-time uh, APs or ASAs. However, we have made the commitment to make sure that there is always some level of support in place, even if we do not put the position in the budget as a full-time uh, administrator position given to the example that Ms. Gomez just shared. So I just wanted to share that with you. That's been our commitment to continue to support those schools, but the support may look different as we uh, prioritize the budget. Okay, so let me clarify for the answer about single administrator, except two elementary schools, We every school has more than one administrator. And for that two elementary schools, we have a fully released teacher to support the administrator. Correct? That's correct. Thank you. 
Yes. That just to add to that, and, uh, for special education, we have three special schools that have a single administrator. Got you. Thank you. And Carla, with regards I, to, I'm sorry. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I was going to ask Carla if I could just ask a quick follow up question to that answer that you just gave. And it's the, my question basically is I don't really understand you're going to have a teacher doing an administrator's job are they getting an administrator's pay or i'm just i'm confused about why we would have teachers doing administrators work as opposed to having an administrator so there, there would be several benefits to that one if we are having onboarding a teacher who's able to support that oftentimes you will see that's the case in our much smaller schools so those schools that have very small student bodies Quite frankly, the support that they need at the administrative level looks very different from a large school. Secondly, fiscally, we're able to uh, save money in that way, still address the priority to make sure there's additional support for the principal, but we don't have to provide that support at the most expensive level, which is to put an administrator in full time. And third, we also benefit from that because we also have a chance to have teachers who may be interested in going into administration have a chance to try out the experiences so that we can see um, how well it works for them as well as them, you know, getting that experience that could then lead them going into the administrative pool. So there are a number of benefits to it. Okay, that part makes sense. That that last part makes sense. I was just concerned that we were asking our teachers to do something that, you know, it goes above their, <clears throat> what they are expected to do normally. So thank you. Absolutely. Okay, let's continue with Ms. Yang's answers. Yes, uh, Ms. Yang, with regards to um, your concerns relative to counseling, we certainly share your interests and we know that um, all of our schools, our students need that uh, social, emotional, behavioral support. Um, in terms of our counseling positions for FY25, um, our schools are maintaining the same allocations uh, that they have for this school year. Um, we look at our schools as we do staffing on an individual school by school basis. And as we look then at the needs of the school, we have some schools that have an additional uh, 0.5, for instance, um, FTE. And um, those are based on um, enrollment. And so within our counseling positions, we may be making some um, changes uh, with those. Ms. Kimbo, um, I understand um, what you're saying, uh, but however, this school year, last year I raised the same question and it, I was told at the time that this year we will have a more comprehensive plan in terms of counseling. Um, I think everyone acknowledged uh, the increased workload uh, in the 504 plan, and everyone acknowledged that there's a disparity in terms of student to counselor ratio in our school districts in terms of secondary and elementary school levels. And I will point out again, this year, four elementary schools with students around 600 and more have only one single counselor. And one of those schools, I believe, also have a single administrator uh, 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 this year. So um, you say the total number from your slide number 13, you clearly show that in the elementary school level, we are decreasing counselors by three positions on slide 13. So if it's enrollment driven from certain schools, and I would definitely would like us, I like to see that our schools with large enrollment has more than one counselors um, serving them. And we do have that. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Dr. Campbell. We definitely do have that initiative where the schools with uh, larger enrollment do have um, uh, additional um, 0.5, for instance, FTE. Um, Can you in terms of looking at the 
support that we provide. Um, one thing to um, also keep in mind is that it's not just the counselors who we are using to meet the uh, social behavioral needs of our students. We have just a, um, a wealth of other resources that we're using. Um, you've heard us talk about our um, uh, restorative uh, justice people who uh, are working with that. We have our social workers in um, certain schools and um, we then uh, bring all of these um, services together in terms of uh, meeting the needs of students. And I'm gonna ask uh, Mr. Monte Leon to um, expand on that. Uh, Dr. Kimball, if, if we could just for a moment before we go to, to uh, Mr. Monte Leone, I wanted to say, uh, Ms. Yang, you're absolutely right in terms of the advocacy that has come from the staff. And we've been looking at the ratio of the counselors to the students for the last couple of years. There's one data point that I want to point to that we talked about in our last year's budget. And I actually don't remember exactly what the number was. I know it was in the millions in terms of what the investment would be if we actually went up to the ratio that the National Association of Counselors recommended for our students. And so, I mean, I feel like our conversation is what is our priority? We're going to get to this in chapter two, and I don't want to steal uh, Mr. Malati, Mr. Monteleone's thunder, but what we do have in this budget are a number of other supports that Dr. Kimball just mentioned. Like in this budget, we have taken off of ESSER and made the commitment to keep 32 social workers who are a big support to this budget um, or to those students within this budget. We also have 19 parent community coordinators who also you know, work with the counselors to be able to provide supports to the community. The six uh, instructional specialists around restorative justice is another example. We're gonna get into those details as I know Mr. Monteleone will do so in chapter two, but I guess the, you know, what we have to work through in this process is given the fact that students need a, 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 a wraparound model of support for them, do we want to make that investment in increasing the counseling ratio and if we do, what will that uh, dollar look like in comparison to reconciling that, as well as these other positions that we know are also critical to providing student services? And of course, we're open to, to that discussion and work at the pleasure of the direction of the board in that area. And Dr. McKnight, and um, in addition to that, um, we are also looking at the wraparound services that our students receive through the community schools. We currently have um, 34 schools there. And uh, through that initiative, we're able to meet a great deal of needs, uh, Ms. Yang. So let's leave the support conversations for the later chapters. Um, have we gotten through all your questions, Ms. Yang? Uh, I think the rest of it in a probably needs some uh, oh, there is the content specialist position in virtual academy. I do not know whether you have the answer now. And I think my uh, question about the certified staff in our building that do not have students specifically assigned to them, that is that probably will take some data uh, compilation. But anyone has an answer about the content specialist position in the virtual academy? I can, and I can take that one. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Mrs. Yang. So um, you're, you are um, absolutely correct. There is content specialist for the uh, middle school program of the MVA, as well as the high school program, which is in the form of a resource teacher currently right now. Um, and you, you uh, noted the um, enrollment being hovering right around 900. It's important to acknowledge that uh, when the program was um, implemented, there was 2,600 students in it. Um, so there's been a, a significant decrease over the past couple of years. We're looking at um, looking at if the content specialist and the resource teacher position should be blended together in some structure. So we're currently studying that right now um, to determine, you know, how to how to because the the caseload. Um, you know, at the in the virtual academy for a content specialist versus a caseload at a uh, at a middle school with in-person learning um, is 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 much larger larger at the in-person level than it is at the uh, virtual academy level. So um, 
I hope that answers your question. That that's something that we're we're looking at um, right now and has been in discussion about. Thank you. I appreciate that. So, uh, um, uh, Madam President, so I only have uh, one question outstanding that will be a follow up uh, right now, and the other will have further discussion in future chapters. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rivera Aben. Questions to chapter one. Okay, so um, since we were talking about the virtual academy, I just want I just want a uh, clarification. The position that you're saying is to consolidate two positions into one, so it's not a supervisory position, correct? So I, what I was saying is we're looking at, at at the, so you have a content specialist for grades six, seven, and eight, and then you have a resource teacher for grades nine through 12, which is, you know, the, there's, there's six to 700 students in the middle and high school program combined together. So we're looking at the potential of how to, how to use that position to share responsibilities potentially. I think the important thing also to, in terms of the administrator piece is those content specialists and those resource teachers can perform evaluations on uh, or observations and evaluations on teachers. Um, so they're able to carry some of the weight um, for the administrators because, um, you know, in, in other places, specifically elementary school, they're they're not able to do that. Does that answer your question, Ms. Rivera? Kind of answer is because I guess I, I was confused or maybe the community is confused about the administration positions. There's only one administrator in charge of the virtual academy. So there is a director, and then there is a and then there is a supervisor that that is essentially like a, in the, an assistant principal. But then you have content specialists for each content area at the middle school level. You have resource teachers that supervise their department um, for each content at the high school level. So you don't have one for elementary. We do not have one for elementary. Currently, as you know, we've phased uh, to two to grades two through six, and it is about it is under 300 students. So out of those, you know, 900 students, we currently have a supervisor and a director um, supporting all 850 students and change. Let me just say what my concern is with that, because as it used to be called something else, the virtual credit, because it's for the kids who are actually, they're homesick. Is that, would that be, or is that a separate program? Am I confusing myself? That's a separate program. Yeah. Okay, so maybe the person who wrote me is also confusing themselves because when you describe the problem, virtual academy, it says, you know, folks with illnesses and health concerns. So we're talking about two different things. Correct, you're talking about interim um, instructional services. Okay. I would like to add, I do think what you are, are thinking about, um, however, is that particularly during the pandemic, we had uh, students who had uh, various um, illnesses and did not want to uh, be in close proximity to um, others. And so, yes, uh, that is a, a part of some of the students. Um, who attend the virtual academy. Okay, so there is a proportion of kids with health issues that are part yes. of ours. Yes. And would it be fair to say that in that group, you also have kids with different IEPs? You might have kids who are, do we have kids who are EML, ESOL? And I think these, um, Dr. Moran is going to speak to this, but but generally, it's as you reference, it's students who are medically challenged. And the other division who deals with kids who are medically challenged, is that long term? Because I, I know there's, we just said there were two, two different programs, so I just want to make sure that so the, my, the public are clear. Yeah. So the intent. So to so support students that are have an interruption in their education due to medical receiving medical services, the venue that they should go through is the 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 interim instructional services. When the program was initiated back when we were coming out of the pandemic, which was essentially a band aid, really to try to you know move and and develop something quickly, we had students that were immunocompromised that were in the program. We've now shifted to the MVA being more. It's a it's it's an apply and it's not based off of um, 
essentially you know medical needs the the venue to to address that is through the the interim instructional services process and that is a temporary it's intended to be temporary we don't uh, our goal is not for students to stay in that what well, that was like three years at a time so for me this would be it would be helpful if you can give me some data of how many of those 900 students are there who have a medical condition and then the ones who do not. I don't need to know who they are. I just need to know 30% of them, 25% of them. Mm -hmm. uh, just kind of like the breakdown in the, in the different categories, you know, EML, special ed, kids, you know, who, because um, to me, and that makes a difference because you can look at the case flow and say, oh, it's only 900 kids and you have so many people. But when you have kids who have a, you know, amplitude of needs who, who kind of need more attention, um, then, you know, that is not so, you know, not so matter of fact that, oh, it's only, you know, so many kids and, and this is something that the staff can handle. So I just want to be, I just want to be cautious that we're not shortchanging some, you know, we're not overwhelming the staff that we have and shortchanging the kids who are ready in the program, if that makes sense. Um, you have can a I question? clarify, um, Ms. Rivera, oven for special education students? So we do have special education staff there. We also have resource teacher that um, they complete the whole IEP process. It is really a choice program at this point for parents. So if parents say, I'd like for my student to go to virtual academy, they fill the application out and they can decide to enroll their student in the virtual academy. And, and, um, that, and is that the case for all students or just that's special for, ed? That's for all students. For all students. Um, and just to further clarify with interim instructional services, that's the process required by law for students either who have a medical or emo social emotional condition that a doctor has said they cannot attend school for a specific period of time. And the goal in IIS is to return the student back to school. Okay. That's Thank available you. for both special education and general education students. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that because that's very different than from a kid who has long-term sickness. I guess they're, and, and that was not very clear to me uh, on the description. So I appreciate the clarification. I still would like to have the data if um, if possible. Um, can I ask now my question about the lunch hour aid? Because it was a significant cut. I'm looking at um, page 10 of chapter one. Um, and just let me know if I read this wrong, but it was the F01 CO3 that we had uh, currently had budgeted 172,000 and then an FY 2025, we're budgeting 14,600. Ms. Rivera, I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Alfonso Windsor to jump in. This actually, I, I didn't uh, clarify that in the beginning, but we do our realignment process. So okay. this kind of was a result of a realignment due to a change in job code. Um, oh, yeah. okay. That's clear on this. I, I panicked. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, but that's I what that was. Actually, <laughs> I can actually talk to this. Um, we changed the job code uh, that we are um, assigning or allocating most of our lunch hour aid assignments to for elementary and middle. So the slides that you saw that Dr. Kimball presented, those are the only loss or gains that you will see in elementary. So it's the uh, about, I think it was about a 2.5 FTE loss in elementary and about a five hour increase in uh, middle school. Um, so it all has to do with a change in the SEIU contract and we're making it a little more smoother for OHRD in my office um, as we allocate these out. All right, so then I panic with, uh, without, a, without good cause. I mean, it was a significant change. Okay, so you're telling me then that we're not losing all the funding for the launching, but it's just a different, allocated in a different, um, code. Yes. Yes. Okay. I think, okay. Ms. Rivera, actually, they are called increase. I think they are getting higher hourly pay. Their job is reclassified from great, like from seven to 11 as their job code. So maybe hopefully that translates to a little bit more money for them. <laughs> I'm hoping. 
that's a really important job. <laughs> um, so can I just then go back to uh, Mrs. Ziang's questions when you do answer her um, about um, the uh, single administrative schools that we had? You said we had two elementary and three special ed schools. Are any of those two, so they don't overlap, correct? The three elementary that are special ed with the two um, schools that have one administrator? No, the they do two. not overlap. Okay, and can you send us what those schools are? And I guess my question is, if you, if it is because of enrollment, because I'm assuming it's because um, it's a manageable enrollment, but I'm just wondering if you look at the ingredients, even if it's a small enrollment, do they have, you know, an increase in EM, because the two places where we have seen an increase are special ed and EML. And do any of those schools actually have seen an increase in any of those two populations or both? And um, would it make sense then maybe to, to so they could have even a part-time administrator to have one administrator for both? And that's what I have, thank you. Do you want us to speak to that right now? Sorry. Yes, if you that be that would be great. I think that in terms of responding to your last question, to have one administrator for for both schools, um, our uh, principals and our staff, I think, really find so much value in terms of having boots on the ground at their particular campus in their school, rather than sharing. Um, a position in the individual schools, just as we said, with the two teacher positions um, that are allocated, the school has the flexibility in terms of determining what type of administrative tasks they want to um, direct the individuals to. I know one of those uh, schools uh, has an enrollment of 220 students. And at one time, we never would have, the system uh, was never thinking about having two administrators at every school. But as Dr. McKnight indicated, then this has been something that's been phased in over a number of times of years. And it's also keeping in mind how our schools have changed. Um, this, the uh, administrators really do see that uh, one teacher who will be providing support at those two smallest schools as something that is really significant that uh, will help the school. And can you just to clarify then uh, Ms. Maldrowski's question about are these teachers who are identified to help to fill in as a as a second administrator, are, you, are they're getting a differential in pay to be able to do that, or do they get the same um, pay stipend? There's no pay differential. They are it. It's a teacher position, okay. but they and, are released. But the benefits related to that they they are fully released from yes. uh, teaching positions, but the benefits associated with that are really great. I mean, it, it's. You know, we think about for our uh, students having interim positions and just as we have with our administrators, the opportunity to be there and work with someone, for them to be able to work closely with another administrator to see what are those things on a larger scale that impact the school community, to be able to have to engage as a thought partner with someone, and that's another um, important part of it that both the teacher will benefit um, from and um, can see then, is this something that uh, is a job that I really am interested in doing uh, later on serving an administrative position? And it is a, it, it is a cost savings. Unfortunately, we can't fund everything to the level that we want to, particularly in a tight uh, budget year like this. 
Can I ask a follow up to that? Does don't we isn't there something at the state that keeps track of? I'm not sure I'm going to say this the right way because I don't know exactly what it is specifically, but it has to do with the number of teachers who are in classrooms and assigned students and um, our performance ratings somehow tied around something like that. I can't remember specifically what it is, but I know in years past, um, <clears throat> Dr. Smith had talked about this, um, really evaluating how many teaching positions we have that are in the classroom versus not in the classroom. Ms. Madrowski, you're referring to the study that was done, the uh, uh, name here, uh, ERS study. Yeah. As a component of the ERS study that was done here when Dr. Smith was here, there was a part of the study that looked at the number of positions that MCPS had that were teaching positions that were in the classroom and out. This particular area was not one that they would have looked at because this was prior to the pandemic. And we created this, this teacher level position as a result of the pandemic, recognizing that we needed to look at what schools needed that had a single administrator given the COVID needs. Um, so this was established after that. That study was more so focused around the effective of, effectiveness of positions like resource teacher and staff development teachers right. and such that are organized that that in which they don't teach a full load. Yes, exactly. Okay, thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay, uh, Ms. Harris and then Mrs. Madrowski. Uh, thank you. I, I think uh, mainly I have a couple of clarifying questions. Um, first of all, uh, just basically under the, um, the slide that you were identifying funding, and FTEs for our alternative education programs. Is RICA fully funded by MCPS or is that a partnership between the school system and the state? RICA is funded um, through MCPS. We fund all of the staffing. We use the facilities that are owned by the RICA, um, part of RICA that is funded through the Maryland Health Department. They also provide clinical staff that works with our staff, but we essentially fund uh, the curriculum and the staff for Rikers uh, services. But not the health and clinical services, just the academic services? Correct. Okay, thank you. And um, uh, a general comment, I, I do appreciate the breakdown looking at uh, acknowledging our enrollment decline overall but our our special populations of students um, are increasing. And so how we're walking the line between an overall decline of students and the needs of the growing number of EML and special education students. But when I look at the aggregate, when you uh, put in a slide, you know, a decrease in 45.7 FTEs at the high school level, 22.7 at the middle school level, 102.7 at the elementary school level, so given our overall number of schools that those reductions equate to less than one FTE per elementary school, less than one uh, FTE per middle school and slightly more than one um, FTE per high school. But it would help me if there is something somewhere, I'm not asking for at this moment, that is a little more specific to where we are seeing those FTEs. Cause I think that does get to our initial conversation around the difference between equity and equality. And equity means we look at these issues based on the needs of each specific school and its enrollment instead of, you know, a broad based application of the same standard everywhere. Um, so just again, I don't expect that right now, but it would help me to see a little bit more specificity around where those FTE reductions are actually landing in our schools. Um, and then uh, another clarifying question I have, when we look at the uh, funding for the virtual academy, um, up until FY25, so every year that we have st stood up the virtual academy, has all of the funding for the virtual academy come from ESSER funding? So all funding that persists for the virtual academy going forward need to be moved for the base budget or were some base budget funds supporting the virtual academy? 
So I, 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 sorry. Go ahead, Yvonne. So um, when the uh, virtual academy was first established, the majority of the funding was coming from ESSER. Uh, there was a small amount that was in the operating budget, but the enrollment was so high that we had to supplement it with ESSER funds. Throughout the years, we have reduced that dependency on ESSER uh, in funding the, the virtual academy. Uh, since some of those, all of those students come from schools, um, then some of those teachers are funded through K-12, you know, as a result of, of the movement, uh, in addition to this budget for the virtual academy. Now this year, because we know that the ESSER funding was going to come to an end, we had to move some of those, you know, we, we did the final move, right, from the ESSER 3 to uh, the local budget, and that's what resulted in the increase of almost $800,000. Okay, thank you. And then, um, so we, you, you've presented a plan for supporting the virtual educa uh, virtual academy for the 24-25 school year. Um, but do we, at, so we've seen, you know, the enrollment from the virtual academies decreased over 60% from 21-22 to this year. Do we know, how? do we have enrollment, have we asked for people to indicate their interest in enrollment for the virtual academy for the 24-25 school year yet? Or are we just estimating how many people we think are going to come back based on the downward trend we've been seeing um, for the past three years. Hey, so, um, hi, everybody. Damon Monteleone here. I can I can help out with this. <clears throat> um, and then I don't know if Dr. Moran or um, if Dr. Kimball want to step up. So a little bit of background. MBA, as was discussed earlier, um, has been shifted to uh, at being a choice program. It is part of our special programs and as such is shared with the community in September, along with all other uh, choice programs, be they magnet programs, career programs, what have you. And parents can um, can sign up or, or identify their student as a possible uh, candidate for that school. Um, and then the process mirrors the processes for all of other choice programs in alignment with DC CAPS. And um, and curriculum and instructional programs. So uh, last year, when I was still involved um, with working through this pro process, we shifted over to um, to the choice process. So parents, do I we we ask in the MBA? We ask our current parents, and I'm not sure I don't have the the, the time frame in front of me, but we ask our current parents generally to to identify if they plan on returning. That comes in December. Around the same time, the choice program application closes, I believe, in the beginning of December. Uh, we are then able to look at all the students that are identifying themselves to be in the choice program for next year. And we can see the number of students who are identifying themselves to leave the program for next year. Um, these numbers are, are, are put together and crunched. And in collaboration with Diane Gomez's office, we identify a full number of students, like we do for all of our other choice and magnet programs. And based on those um, those students and the final numbers that we have for next year, uh, Ms. Gomez um, uh, uh, then goes through the, the traditional staffing ratios to ensure that this, the MBA has the, the, the students that it, it needs. So that's the whole process. So the answer should be yes. But I wanted to give everybody an, um, kind of an overview of how that works. So let me ask a quick follow-up there. Um, for most of our choice programs, we we are, there's a there's a dedicated number of seats available and you know students either you know are are evaluated by you know they apply and they're evaluated in or they're lotteried in but once the number of seats are filled the number of seats are filled is that the case have we just is that the case with the virtual academy we've said there are x number of seats in the in the virtual academy people can apply and get lotteried in or not, or are we just saying we'll and we will accommodate everybody that wants the virtual academy? No, and again, I don't know if, if this has uh, changed, Dr. Moran, but we identified a cap of fifteen hundred uh, in the fall of twenty two, as we shifted to a choice program. Um, we communicated out to the community that if we went over fifteen hundred that we would engage in the same lottery process that we have for all other choice programs. Again, having some consistency uh, with, with the MBA, um, with all of our other choice programs. So I don't know if Dr. Moran or, or Dr. Kimball who have picked up this work this year 
Uh, I don't know if that cap of 1500 has shifted, but that is exactly how it was um, how it was born, so to speak. And we certainly communicated all of that through the application process. Yeah. So, Mrs. Harris, um, mm -hmm. similar to your opening remarks regarding the um, decline in enrollment uh, based off of just the, the 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 choice process, the program for FY 2025 um, is funded based off of a 1200 uh, student um, number. So um, the cap has dropped from 1500 to 1200. Okay. Um, but given the downward trend, the dramatic downward trend in enrollment, when will we take a relook and make sure we're staffing for the number of students we have, not 1,200, which is significantly more than we currently have? I, I th and so that is, go ahead, Dr. Kimmel. I, I was going to say that definitely is the work that we have to do. There are a couple of issues that we have looked at as we have addressed this uh, downward trend in enrollment. Um, one issue was that as we look at chronic absenteeism in the uh, virtual academy, um, it exceeds that in our other uh, programs. And of course, we do recognize that uh, some of the students in this program, though, may be uh, medically fragile. But there are other issues that we're looking at, too, in, in terms of socialization issues. When students are in this program, they don't have those opportunities to socialize with their peers. I share uh, those two things um, in reference to uh, what Ms. Hazel said earlier in terms of when the program was designed, it was not designed to uh, be a long-term option. And we clearly do need to uh, do our due diligence and uh, absolutely um, look further um, into the um, program so that we are providing a, a program that uh, really is providing the uh, academic backbone and everything that we want it to have. Okay, I mean, my concern is just, we need to make sure that we're budgeting for the number of students that are actually there instead of the num you know, an arbitrary number because um, the budget's very, very tight. Um, so I appreciate that. And somebody put, uh, Diane, Ms. Gomez put into the chat that the current budget is not based on 1,200 students, basing it on projections, which is much lower. And I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and then the last, um, I guess it's uh, more of a comment. Looking at slide 17, very much appreciated the fact that there was $150,000 earmarked for um, any cost that might be associated with a school that does decide to change its name um, in alignment with the board's 2020 resolution to engage communities who uh, whose schools are named for enslavers in that conversation. Um, this does, however, align with some concerns that I have about the report that recently came to the board about the, the results of the community engagement process with the Magruder High School community. Um, because if you read that report very closely, it is very, very clear that the community was led to believe that the co there would be significant costs associated if they decided to change their name and that it would be the community that bore the cost of those, which is not in fact accurate. And, and, and especially in con, is uh, inconsistent with the fact that we have um, identified a line item in the budget to account for any costs. And many of the costs are simply um, recurring costs that occur in the ordinary course of business. So uniforms wear out and are replaced, stationary runs out and you reorder more, that kind of thing. And so I'm just putting this out there as um, I'm I think that we are going to need to take a close look at the report that came out of the community engagement process with the Magruder community and the ways in which that community seems to have believed that uh, cost would be a significant impediment and factor if they decided to change the name of the school. So um, anyway, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harris. I do want to say I think that that will come back as a full conversation to really talk about that engagement process so that we can be, um, you know, just clear about what was in the report, which then could be what could be a community uh, perception or understanding that was, you know, that may provide an opportunity for clarity. So I look forward to that. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Mrs. Landrowski. And then after Mrs. Landrowski, we are going to take a break. Just a heads up about that. Uh, Mrs. Landrowski. Okay, thank you. Um, in the interest of time, I will try to be short and quick, but a um, couple of little things. Um, are the ESSER funds that we are have moved into our budget, are all of them reoccurring budget items or are any of them one-time costs? Everything is a reoccurring uh, cost right now while we've moved from the ESSER to the operating budget. Um, of the $33 million that we moved, everything is a recurring cost. The okay. majority of it is, is, is positions and then items that we already had in the base budget. If you remember last year, we moved some items from the base budget to the ESSER to balance the budget, and some of those things are coming back, but everything is recurring. Okay, thank you. And then um, my uh, other thing is about instructional specialists. Um, <clears throat> I, didn't, I didn't know if I necessarily specifically saw where we were um, losing instructional specialists, but I'm curious as to um, are we losing any, from what areas are they coming out of and, um, and, um, what are the, you know, what are basically, what are we losing and why, why are we, um, removing them? I know SEIU has expressed some concern about our career pathways program. I forget what it's technically called. Um, you know, the program that has, um, leadership uh, folks who help take uh, is part of our growing our own sort of uh, product where, you know, someone who is in the SEIU um, range may want to grow in order to become a teacher or, you know, a bus driver, maybe you want to come a paraeducator, things like that. Um, can you tell me, are those positions being removed? Um, I was told two of them were being removed, and then there were others that are direct um, supports in the classrooms that I understood are being removed. Thank you for the question, Ms. Mondrowski. In terms of instructional specialists, when we get to chapter two, we are going to talk about some instructional specialists um, where uh, we have had some budget efficiencies. We have five instructional um, specialists um, who have. You went on mute. I'm sorry, that have been cut in the FY25 budget. And we'll talk about that soon. And OK. All right, well, I, I can wait. I just, I will preface this by letting you know that my question is going to be, you know, one of my questions around that is going to be, um, you know, who are we losing and why, and whether or not we've looked at doing any kind of restructuring um, at the central office level, such as removing one of the layers, you know, we've got our directors, and then we've got three, I guess they're called area superintendents now, and then a chief of schools, and do we really need all of those layers, um, or could we re- Vamp how that works to keep the money going to positions that affect in the classrooms specifically. So that's for chapter two. Coming up. Answer. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. If there are no other questions, well, we're going to take a 10 minute break. I do want to do a time check. We are over two hours into our four hour meeting. And according to the slide deck, we're probably a third. Um, through. So um, just for us to be aware of that, and I will see everyone back here at uh, 2.28. I'm sorry, 1.28. <laughs> Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we will now continue uh, with our budget work session. We are continuing with uh, Chapter 1, Special Education Services. Could we have the slide deck and Ms. Kimball? Good afternoon. Next slide. Um, and actually, it's going to come to me, Diana Wiles, Associate Superintendent for the Office of Special Education. Good afternoon, uh, President Silvestri, Dr. McKnight, and board members. The Office of Special Education ensures the students who are eligible for special education and related services are provided a free, appropriate public education based on their unique needs. We provide a continuum of services from birth to age 21 to prepare our students who are both um, working towards a high school diploma or who may be working towards a program, uh, a certificate of program completion. The special education budget is reflected in two chapters of the total budget. Chapter one reflects funding that goes directly to schools, while chapter five reflects funding for central office supports and services as well as to our youngest learners and our infants and toddlers program. On this slide, you see the total budget for the Office of Special Education between chapters one and five is $462.3 million. Our priorities are reflected in our budget. 82% of our total budget is for salaries and wages for our nearly 5,000 staff members who support our students with IEPs. This includes, but is not limited to our teachers, our paraeducators, our occupational and physical therapy, therapists, speech pathologists, and the remaining funds goes to various items that directly support schools, such as contractual services for related services, supplies, equipment, and curriculum for our students with the most significant cognitive disabilities. <clears throat> because of the interest of the board with regard to contractual services, I just wanted to take a moment because you'll see it throughout the presentation where we're spending contractual services. A large part of our funding for contractual services goes to our speech pathologists. What we've seen is an increase in student need as well as increase in students being identified for speech and language services over time. But in addition to that, the workforce has changed. Uh, there's a desire for more opportunities to telework. And during the pandemic, um, ASHA, which is the uh, National Organization for Speech Pathologists, as well as the state of Maryland, and MSDE authorized telehealth and the provision of speech and language services through telehealth. So we've gotten an increase, um, a, a, an increase in vacancies because of the changes in what our workforce desires as it relates to uh, providing those specific services to students. Now, I understand and I hear the challenges that uh, parents face and feel that that might not be what they want for their children, but we have an obligation to continue to provide the services. And so that is what we have done through contractual services. So you'll see throughout the presentation and in the, in the coming slides where those services, um, where that money falls and why there's been an increase uh, for FY25. In addition to that, um, our contractual services uh, are also for our sign language interpreters and for a small number of occupational and physical therapy um, therapists. We also have seen rate increases for um, those contractual services. So in the next slides, I will get into some of that in more detail. Next slide. The total special education funding in chapter one, which we'll be focusing on in the next several slides, is 344.1 million. 96% of the budget or 329 million is invested in our staff. 
These are our special education teachers, our paraeducation educators, our OTs, PTs, and speech pathologists who directly work in the schools with our students. The funding is for both is both through our local operating budget as well as through grant funding through the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act or IDEA. An additional 6.6 .6 million is spent on contractual services where we have vacancies that we have not been able to fill for the reasons that I just discussed. We have to ensure a continuity of services that we're required to provide students. And additionally, there are certain contractual services that we don't hire for because of the very specialized need for uh, specific students. So for example, that would be our private duty nurses that may support students with some significant medical needs, as well as music and art therapy, which there's a small number of students that based on their needs, they require that type of service. Lastly, we've invested contractual funds to support the curriculum for our students who are working towards a certificate of program completion and for our academic in interventions for students who require additional support outside of the general education curriculum for reading and math. We're requesting supplies and materials funds for our audiological assistive technology materials for our deaf and hard of hearing students, as well as our vision uh, students who require services in the area of vision. We're asking for $5,000 for office supplies for Rock Terrace School, which is one of our special schools. $497,000 for extended school year services, which are required by law based on student eligibility, which is determined annually. And this is all based on growing student enrollment, which I'll talk about in the coming slides. The budget also highlights our increased need for equipment for specialized mobility and seating equipment for students who have those needs. This enables students to have equitable access to learning experiences in the school environment. Lastly, we're requesting funding to support assistive technology equipment needs due to increased cost and student need. This technology assists students with physical therapy and occupational therapy needs, as well as students who need adaptive communication devices. Next slide. The funding in chapter one is based on an increased enrollment for students with disabilities as has been discussed earlier today. Unlike the overall student enrollment in MCPS that's projected to decline by 880 students, we are anticipating and projecting an enrollment growth of approximately 450 students throughout special education for FY 2025. This reflects an increase of increased need of 112.3 positions and seven which equates to $7.3 million, and that's all direct support to students. We project for FY25 that students with disabilities will represent approximately 14.06% of our total MCPS enrollment. And the reason why that's important is because if you look at the trend data over time, when we go back to FY20, the first year of uh, the COVID pandemic, Special education students represented 12.4%. So we have grown at about 2% over the last five years. The enrollment increases represent the need for an additional 53.5 special education teachers, 3.5 OT, PTs, and 55.3 paraeducator positions. Additionally, as as I stated before, there is a national shortage of speech and language pathologists, and we continue to use those contractual services so that we can make sure our students are receiving the services that they're entitled to. We do have a partnership with the University of Maryland, which, which uh, we pay a certain portion of tuition so that we can have speech pathologists who are exiting into the workforce in MCPS, and then they would give that time back to us. Um, we're working with the Office of Human Resources Development to recruit 
for all of the vacancies um, in speech and language services, as well as all others. But that said, there's a need for, for the need that we have for services to our students far outweighs the availability of the workforce at this time. Because of that, we're asking for additional contractual services in amount of 1.1 million. Next slide. In an effort to maximize our resources and address priority spending needs within our various services, there's a net increase of $429 and $429 thousand two hundred thirty three dollars and a decrease of 16.5 positions that we are realigning we looked at financial trends and determined that we could realign funds from substitute teachers which we have uh, substitute teacher positions that have not been fillable to fund additional critical staffing salaries our critical staff are uh, positions that work directly with students based on their individual needs. So this could be students that have mobility issues, that have behavioral needs, um, or that have medical conditions that require them to have uh, another adult near them throughout the school day. So we've re realigned those funds to support critical staffing. We also looked at our vacancies over time for our speech pathologist positions. And we've realigned 15 of the vacant positions that have remained unfilled over time and converted that fund into contractual services in order to ensure that we have sufficient funding to pay for those services and provide a continuity of services to our students. And I just wanna be clear that that doesn't mean that, that it, one, it does not include all of our vacancies for speech pathologists. Um, and two, that we continue to um, try to fill those vacancies. The ultimate goal most certainly is to bring on speech pathologists who are MCPS employees. Next slide. As a result of increases in our continuing salaries uh, with our unions, we've shifted funds from our IDEA grant to our, our local budget. We do these grant shifts uh, because of the limited amount of money on the fund, on a, limited, a limited amount of money through grant funding. Because of the continuing positions and the salary increases on grants that exceed the total amount of funds on these grants, we've shifted the funds to local to ensure that we have sufficient funds for those positions or equipment or supplies. So wherever you see a grant shift, it was to make sure that we have sufficient funding for that specific need. So this has resulted in a reduction of 1.7 million from our IDEA grant funds. We moved 815,000 from grant to local budget for contractual services in the area of private duty nurses. Finally, as demand for contractual services, contractual speech and language services has continued to increase, the rate for these services through contractual agencies has increased requiring us to request an increase of over $287,000 in order to ensure that we can fund those services. Can you repeat that, Diana? Can you repeat that one more time? I missed something in the beginning of that. Certainly. Um, we shifted funds from IDEA so that we can ensure that we can cover what is on IDEA. And then we put those fund, th that money onto our local budget. What we have seen is that because there is a national shortage of speech pathologists um, and a challenge just across the nation with filling those vacancies, contractual services has gone up, but the rate has also gone up in order to obtain those services. So we've asked for an additional $287,000 so that we can make sure that we have sufficient funds so that we can pay for those for our students. Next slide. 
Finally, <clears throat> in chapter one, there's specific strategic priorities for the district that are represented in the special education budget. For the blueprint, um, the blueprint for Maryland's future mandates that we increase the number of full-time pre-K seats, um, as Ms. Owens has previously discussed during this presentation. And as we expand our general education pre-K classes, we have to grow in a parallel form um, our special education classrooms. So in order to do that, we've asked for $3 million in new positions to accommodate the expansion of full day pre-K for special education students. In special education, we grow in two different ways for our pre-K students. First, our self-contained special education classrooms um, based on projections and the number of seats that we plan to open on the general education side, we look at what we can grow on the special education side. So we are growing by 15 teachers and nearly 17 paraeducators, as well as three speech pathologists in order to shift classes from full day, from half day to full day in some places and create new classes in others. So these are classes for students that are only receiving special education services, but who also may be, are also in buildings that have full day general education uh, pre-K opportunities. In addition to that, we have our students who are receiving services inside a general education class with their non-disabled peers. So as pre-K general education classes grow, we are able to have a certain number of our special education students in, that, in those classes, but then it also requires additional staffing so that they can support students in the general education class. For students receiving physical disability services, we've included an accelerator to purchase required mobility and seating equipment so that they can have equitable access to the school environment. With an increase in students enrolling and moving into, into our schools, we are seeing students with more complex physical access and safety needs. This equipment will help those students to be provided what they are required to have in their IEP, and it will allow them to access their environment and be included in the school setting with their non-disabled peers. Next slide. Now I'm going to shift to chapter five. The total budget for our central office special education funding is $118.2 million. So this includes all of our central office employees who support special education, as well as all of our positions in the Montgomery County Infants and Toddlers Program. These are our students that receive services beginning at birth and prior to entering school. This represents 48%, the positions for infants and toddlers represents 48% of our overall central office budget. For the reasons I previously discussed, we continue to request funding for contractual services for this group of students as well, as well as for um, language interpreting services for our deaf and hard of hearing students. Other contractual services in the budget for chapter five include our support and include supporting our partnership with the foundation school. Foundation is a non-public special education school that we have had con cont a contractual relationship with. Um, this is our second year. Uh, what it allows us to do is to provide a limited number of students a direct placement where we cannot meet their very significant needs in a public school setting. The, in addition to that, the fees for the collection of medical assistance, as well as fees associated with dispute resolution, um, which is a required process in special education, 
um, through our resolution compliance unit, those are other fees that you would see under our contractual services. The remaining 49% of chapter five's budget for special education is our non-public tuition where we are, currently have approximately 600 students who we place in schools outside of Montgomery County Public Schools because we don't have the resources internally or they have needs greater than what can be offered in a public school setting. Next slide. As, well, as has been discussed in chapter one, we project significant enrollment growth in chapter five. We are projecting for our infants and toddlers students, 150 new students in FY 2025. This, is, this will require additional staffing of one teacher in the physical disabilities unit and over 15 classroom positions, including teachers, paraeducators, and related service providers. We do project as a change, a, a reduction in our non-public residential services. So we do have students who we pay, fund, who we fund at residential schools. Um, currently, we are projecting that four of those students will be returning from a residential setting, which accounts for $1.5 million of our non-public budget. Next slide. Similar to chapter one, we, we realign funds to priority areas in the amount of 78,000 from various departments and divisions to support an ever increasing need for translators. This, this is translation of IEP documents where parents have asked because they are not native English speakers to have their IEP documents translated. Further, we realign 2.6 vacant positions for language interpreters. So these are our sign language interpreters and transliterators an amount of 197,000 to allocate for additional contractual interpretation services. So just as we did with our speech and language pathologist vacancies that have remained for a period of time unfilled, we took 2.6 of the interpreter unfilled positions and converted them to contractual because we are required to ensure the students who are deaf, hard of hearing, sign language users have those supports and services. Next slide. As a result of the autism waiver in the weight law, which I will explain more in the next slide, a law that was passed in 2022, we anticipate increased revenue from our medical assistance grant our students who are Medicaid eligible, we are allowed to bill for services in school that are related to their disability and the services that we provide in, uh, in our schools. So we are anticipating an increase in that revenue. However, the increase in the number of students who are eligible under the autism waiver will also increase the need that we have for staffing to support the autism waiver, which again, I'll explain a little bit more in a, in a moment. Based on this, we decreased about four paraeducator and 1.5 teacher positions that again, remained unfilled for extended periods of time to meet the growing needs of students awaiting autism waiver services. Additionally, as a result of continuing salaries and instructional materials, we should, we're, we shifted from infants and toddlers uh, that money to our local budget. Lastly, during the FY24 legislative session, a law was passed, um, the teacher parity for non-public teachers law. This requires school systems to implement a three-year phase-in plan 
in which MCPS along with MSDE pay a portion of the salaries for teachers in non-public schools so that their salaries have parity with public school teacher salaries. We are um, in FY25, we will be in year two of this three-year phase-in plan, which requires us to increase the rate at which we pay for non-public services. And that rate increase is 6.5% for tuition. That reflects $3.6 million increasing in our non-public spending. Next slide. The Autism Waiver is a state program that provides home and community-based services for students who have, a, have been identified with an autism spectrum disorder. It's funded through Medicaid or waives costs for certain state and local services to these students who are eligible. The In the Wait Law was designed to reduce the long wait times for eligible students with autism to receive those services to, to su support their needs. These are not services that supplant any of the services that we already provide this group of students in our schools. Rather, these are supplemental services that they receive. Um, they, you could call them wraparound services that they may receive in their home or in their communities. The Office of Special Education is responsible for screening autism waiver applicants and evaluating students to determine whether or not they are eligible to receive those services. In order to support the growth and the number of students who may be enrolled on the autism waiver and based on the end the wait law, we've submitted an accelerator for a 1.0 instructional specialist and a 1.0 secretary. The responsibilities of the instructional specialist will be to determine eligibility for the autism waiver, which requires reviewing uh, information, evaluations, records, contacting parents um, to determine if they meet the state requirements. The secretary will support family outreach as well as coordination of those services once students are eligible. We are anticipating an increase of approximately 450 students who will be awaiting an eligibility determination as to whether or not they can receive autism waiver services. Prior to the passing of the in the wait law, the wait time for students to get a determination about eligibility for autism waiver services was about 10 years. We are anticipating the need to double the capacity of the staff that we have doing this work so that we can focus on the goal to decrease that wait time by 50% or more. Next slide. And with that, I will turn it over for questions. Quickly, I know that Mr. Hall mentioned this at the beginning, but can you remind us again, Mr. Hall, why we have special ed in chapter one and chapter five? Absolutely, thank you for that question. So um, chapter one is everything that is actually included in the school budgets. Uh, and so that anything, you know, uh, teachers and paras who are located at the school would be there. But of course we have a, many, many other things throughout the budget, including special ed that even though they're budgeted centrally, the services are being provided directly to students. And so uh, as Ms. Wilds kind of uh, went through in her presentation, there are a number of services, uh, whether it's pre-K or some of these um, private placements that are budgeted locally, but do go to serve students directly. Thank you. Go to Ms. Ev Mrs. Evans. Yes, yeah, so thank you, Ms. Wiles, for the presentation. You know, I, I've said it before, I'll say it again. You would not know that you've only been with us two, this will be your second budget cycle in this position, and you sound like you've been here for so many years. Special education is, is, is a lot. Um, you said a lot, and I want to ask you this. Can you explain to us how you go about allocating staff for special education? 
And at what point in time do you factor in the contractual services? Like, is that simultaneous or is it at another point? Can you just explain that piece for me, please? Sure. Um, so what we do is we look at the sets of services that we have. Um, so we have our homeschool model students who are, who are in their uh, comprehensive buildings uh, with their general education peers. Um, and we look at all of those sets of services, our autism services, our services for students who are not working towards a diploma through our more re most restrictive placements in the district, our special schools, Rock Terrace, Carl Sandburg, um, Longview. And based on the services the students provide, we staff based on a number of students and staff that we need, as well as paraeducators that we need, given the level of need the students have. So in some cases, the staffing is allocated by the number of hours um, in aggregate for the students in a building. So that would be in, in our homeschool models versus in some of our autism services, we would staff based on the number of students who we project will be in a certain school um, in receiving specific services. We would say how many students do we have and what's best practices for the number of teachers and parents we would need to support that number of students. In tandem, we look at contractual services. Um, so we know over time, um, it's there's a stark contrast when you look at um, our vacancy rates post pre-COVID and post-COVID. And so what we have done is unfortunately the vacancy rate specifically for speech pathologists has increased over time um, where we may have had about two vacancies, FY20, we have 40, uh, around 40 now. But again, that goes back to some of the changing needs and, and desires for the workforce to be able to provide the services um, virtually. And so we do both at the same time because we, we are consistently looking at what those vacancy rates are um, and determining whether or not we need to increase a position on contract on a contract because we've we don't have sufficient staffing for that particular area. Did I answer the Yeah, I think you did. I was trying to I was trying to see because I in thinking about how we do staffing and then thinking about contractual services, I just don't want it to give the appearance that we're um overstaffing, right? That we right. So so that was that was an explanation. So that was good. Thank you. And then um so based on what you said about speech, speech pathologists, did I hear you say that um, that they do a lot of their work through telehealth? Yeah, so many of the contractual um, companies that we use that provide speech pathologists, they work through telehealth. All of our contractors are not telehealth providers. We do have some that, will, um, that we have assigned to schools that are physically in-person in schools. However, um, as I said, the workforce has, has spoken, <laughs> and especially in this regard, because of the use of telehealth during the during COVID. Um, mm -hmm. So we have a number of speech pathologists that are providing services through telehealth. Um, what we do in our um, our supervisor of speech services. She identifies based on suit needs where we should be focusing our efforts on providing someone in person versus providing someone virtually. Perfect. Okay. I just want people to hear that there's a lot of thought that um, you put into how you allocate the resources. And then, and so Ms. Wiles, and this is what I do know. I do know that it's always a catch-22 for the school system because while we don't want to use contractual services, we don't want our students to go without getting and receiving the services. So can you then to talk about, so we're in this, so I'm going to ask you a tough question. We're in this current budget cycle, but as we think about going into the next budget cycle, are you giving thought or can you talk about how we give thought to 
what we can do to um, use the people that are currently in our system or not have to use as many contractual services? Or are we even in that position to be able to do that given the, the, the shortage or, so or the huge need? Certainly. Um, we, we're doing, we have several different tracks that we're working on. We are always working in tandem in, in Office of Special Education. We are always working in tandem with human resources to try to fill vacancies. That's the priority. Um, so we've done a lot of work around creating our college and university um, partnerships. Um, as I said, we have relationship with University of Maryland where we do get a, a few of their speech pathologists who are going through their program that ultimately graduate and come to work for us. Um, we are working to recruit in tandem with HR. Um, but as you as you said, we can't unfortunately walk away from the need for contractual services because as we have these vacancies, um, students still need services and we have to provide them. Absolutely. So I appreciate you not being HR, but being in special education, but also thinking about where we can go to look to get um, staff to be able to help support us in addition to um, going the route that we don't necessarily want to go in, but we know that we need to be able to support our students. So I just wanted to sometimes like you, I was trying to get you to trying to um, get you to um, pull out some of the work that you do that doesn't always come at the top of our minds when we think about what your work looks like or what it is with education, but that there is some cross collaboration with your office and HR. And so um, just appreciate the thoughtfulness um, and the work that you're having to take to really think about how we provide the services for all of our students. And as you talked about, that really hit me. And do you know this answer? And you and, and this me asking, you mentioned that because we do know that COVID has exacerbated a lot of the many um, issues that we're seeing in our students. You talked about pre-COVID, um, our percentage of students was 12% and where it's risen to now 14%. Prior to COVID, do you think our increase was a 1% increase over every year or a half a percent? Or can you even say that? I'm just asking the top of my head because I thought about that um, that number that you stated. And I think since I've been on the board and I've been on the board almost eight years that it's kind of stayed at the percent that you mentioned pre-COVID since I've been on the board. So does it take a number of years for it to get to that increase typically as opposed to this huge increase um, since we've come back in person? And then I'll let my other colleagues ask questions. Sure. Um, so I think when we looked at data back to about 2017, um, the percentage of students receiving special education services was pretty steady at a, about 11%. There might have been incremental growth, but when you look at it for the last five years or for the last four years and we project for next year it has grown uh, exponentially um, and while I think most of what we know is anecdotal because right. no one has researched truly what has happened but we see and we talk and talking to our uh, colleagues in the schools behavior needs have increased um, we know that the learning loss has impacted academic achievement. And then as I talked about earlier, um, we looked at our infants and toddlers data and the number of families that were taking advantage of infants and toddlers services for the period of time when COVID closed everything. It's decreased the number of students getting those services. So I think the we're in a place where it's maybe a rebound effect where they should have gotten those services earlier, not for any reason that we didn't provide it. They just were not con connected with infants and toddlers because of the state of the world. 
Right. But now we're seeing those students who may have gotten early intervention and have been would have been more prepared for school now needing what they didn't get three years ago. Yep. Been based on those increases, I, I would think it would be difficult to be able to try to match staff to all the needs of our students. So um, I just, I don't know if everybody really thinks about how difficult or how complex um, departments which education is, but um, I do know that you really take a deep dive into it. So I appreciate that. So thank you for answering my question. Mrs. Evans, can I just thank add, uh, just for the general public, that um, we've been talking about our uh, K-12 staffing guidelines as well as our special ed. So the pre-K to 12 budget staffing guidelines are in Appendix C in the budget book uh, and special education staffing plan and their budget guidelines are in Appendix D. Thank you. And those uh, are really helpful appendices. So I encourage uh, the viewers to really take a look at that uh, because it's very good information. I think I'm always at saying, how are schools funded? How are schools funded? Our allocations? And then the answer is, is there. Um, thank you, Ms. Harris. Yeah, I just want to concur. I think those the appendices to these budget um, booklets are that's where some of the meatiest information is that really gets to issues that uh, people in the system ask us all the time. So very much agree. Those are uh, those are such helpful documents. And uh, Ms. Wise, I think most of my questions are just clarifying. Um, so when you, um, I believe it's on slide 31, we're talking about IDEA and the projection of of about $2.5 million that MCPS was essentially not going to assume we would receive. So we were we were programming those costs into the base budget. Is it possible that we will receive more IDEA funds than we are anticipating? And so some of those, there might be some, uh, there might be less pressure on the, on the base budget because of that? So, um, that's possible. We won't know until late spring okay. what the um, grant awards under IDEA will be. We have several IDEA grants that are geared towards different areas of work that we do in special education, but we don't see those awards until maybe around April or so. So okay. we project based on what we currently know, what the um, grant funds awarded were. Um, and then it's adjusted by MSDE. Okay. So it it might get better, but we won't know for a while. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. And then um, um question you uh, am I understanding correctly that <clears throat> uh the increase in non-public tuition that is being estimated at about a six point five percent increase for this year. And so, and commit, and so the the increase in our budget line item for that non-public tuition, so that the increase it, we're projecting is not due to increased students being placed, but it, due to the projected increase in um, tuition amount, the six point five percent increase in tuition amount. So, I think it's it's two things. So we do project based on trend data the number of students we anticipate will be in non-public schools. You know, obviously that may change um, given the students that come into the district um, or if students uh, exhibit needs that were not anticipated when we did the budget. Um, so we have a projection for that. Separate and apart from that is this teacher parity law right. that, sp that specifically relates to um, increasing the salaries of the non-public teachers so that they are uh, near what the public school teachers receive. That is the 6.5% rate increase. Right. But it, so it sounds like, though, that most of the increase in that line item is coming because of the increase in tuition and not so much the projected number of students we think will be placed. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then I did just, and this is just um, bouncing off of uh, Mrs. Evans' questions, um, <clears throat> listening in depth to your um, discussion about the, the contractual services that we're using, 
mostly related to essential therapy services, especially speech language, um, multiple factors playing into that. And it gets to a supply demand issue with the number, the demand we have for the services and then the supply of people out there who have that expertise and also want to work in person in schools. Um, I just want to make sure, though, that when we're looking at an almost doubling in our budgeting for contractual services for our special education students, it sounds like you're saying we are we are realigning positions that we just know have remained vacant for a long time. And instead of going ahead and creating those positions in the in the budget, we're just saying we won't be able to hire them. We know that because of trend data. So we're going to take the money that we would have used to create those positions. We're going to move that to contractual services instead of us having budgeted for those positions that we hope we can fill, but think, but know we probably can't while simultaneously increasing dramatically our, our um, budget item for contractual services. That's correct. Okay. Um, thank you. And then the last question I have um, gets to, you mentioned the, 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 the ways that we, we program around special education students and there are students that are in contained classrooms, students that sort of move from contained classrooms to special education class uh, to, to general education classrooms based on the the content knowledge or the the you know what's happening like for a special and then you you know we have students that are special education students in the general education um population who are getting their their services in the general ed classroom and my question gets you when we have a student who's needs a special education student who's being served in a general education classroom and they move from school to school because we do have a lot of mobility in MCPS. Um, and sometimes those students are moved, you know, because they just move. And then sometimes their move is less voluntary. But when a student in who is has significant special education needs being served in a general ed classroom moves from school to school, do the people who provide them services move with them? Or do we just hope the school that they move to has the staffing necessary to meet those needs? So that's a good question. Um, and thank you for that question, because I think that highlights the work that our what our central office staff does. And so we have instructional specialists and supervisors that help to facilitate those moves when students are either moving because they need something that's not available in school A that they need at school B. They help facilitate those moves. We also look regularly at staffing at schools so that, you know, one student is not going to change, necessarily change the number of teachers and parents that you need. But if we're moving several students to a school, we're also looking at, is there a need to allocate additional staffing for paraeducators, for teachers, um, or is there, is it necessary to allocate additional critical staff. And so if there is critical staff attached to helping a specific student, then the person may not necessarily move, but the allocation would move so that the next school can uh, is able to meet that need for the student. Yeah. And I appreciate that because I know I've talked to um, principals who have special programs or who are serving students with special needs in uh, general education programs. And they will say, and it, their challenge is that, you know, an allocation isn't a staff person. So, um, and I know that's very difficult. And I, I just ask in part, because we've seen, I've seen more this year, um, families raising concerns about students with significant needs in classrooms that seem that we seem to be struggling to meet and, and levels of disruption to the operation of the classrooms and how those are being handled school to school. And um, so I guess my last question is, what level in your office of flexibility is there during a school year to adjust the staffing to meet the needs of, of students in a school as those change over time in within the course of a school year? Um, I, the short answer is it depends. Um, it, it, it depends on the need. It depends on the current staffing at a school. Um, but we 
look at whether or not there are places where we in, where we need to adjust those allocations. Um, one of the things we have to remember is that in those allocations, allocations may sit people. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that we can, we want to avoid telling um, someone, okay, five students have moved, so we need you to move to school X in the middle of the school year. So we want to avoid that to the extent that we can. Um, however, we look at it and uh, regularly, and we also work with um, our K to 12 partners so that if there is a need to look more widely at a school that's asking for different additional staffing allocations, we can look at all of the um, staffing at that school and make adjustments as appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Rivera Oven, you have the final word before we proceed with the next chapter. Just a quick, I just wanted to see where in this presentation last week when um, we were presented with um, the English, uh, the English language development update for our EML students, um, at least I learned that we had an over presentation of EML students with disabilities. And I'm just trying to see where in this in this allocation of funds that population falls in allocating either teachers or um, kids who are EML or ESOL. Are they going to be classes, you know, for them? Like I'm just trying to understand the breakdown of that. And I just had a curious question because um, since we're seeing an increase. And you mentioned that a lot of the kids with severe disabilities and so on, Medicaid, um, that were able to charge Medicaid or Medicare for, for some of those um, services. Does the special education team, does your team have a, um, a Medicaid uh, specialist, a, a code person to ensure that we are maximizing uh, everything we can to charge Medicaid? Uh, yes. So I'll start with the Medicaid question. We do have someone at central office that monitors um, and sends out reports monthly to schools so that we can identify where we are maximizing the amount that we can um, bill for those services or where there may be some challenges with billing for those services. We reach out to those schools um, at least monthly um, more often if necessary. Um, and then we provide technical assistance where there may be new teachers who need some support with how to um, handle that billing process. Uh, with regard to the uh, way we staff for EML students with, with uh, who need special education services, they're included in our total count of students. So when we look at, um, when when we plan for staffing and we project for the following year, um, we meet separately which, with each supervisor and then we meet with schools to determine what they are projecting in terms of the number of students. So we don't separate out necessarily the number of EML students. We do know um, in our two-way immersion schools that those are schools that are centered around students who are EML and that many of them have special education services. So we just with, as we do with any other school, make sure that we are appropriately staffed based on our staff and plan. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There's Miss, pardon me, Miss Vestry, there's one thing I wanted to uh, mention and I think it's important because I wanted to highlight this at the very beginning of the chapter, but there were two areas that I shared with the board that I commissioned the staff to develop these community of practice or work groups around um, to delve into two specific areas. One was special education. Um, and we needed to dig into this area because we wanted to address one, the increase in services that we've already talked about to deeply understand the why and what those needs are I've heard a lot of that from the teachers as I've gone out and done my listen to lead sessions as they describe that some of the services that students are coming in with 
much of it comes to, you know, in the space of levels they haven't had to provide supports for in the past. And so they're trying to figure out what is the professional development or the right support structure I need to be able to provide services for these students given these needs. So we need to pull the layers back and understand and address that. So that's one area. The second area is just overall, what is the support structure needed for teachers that will allow them to truly provide the support needed to students? Many of the structures that we've used, we've talked about in this work session, gets to you know years of what those structures have been around the resource teacher um, and what that allocation is and all of those pieces. That also needs to be looked at from a broad and wide perspective. And then that gets to the third, what are the structural needs? You know, Where do we have the programs? How are we staffing those programs? Going back to uh, this whole centering it around student needs, not just essentially what we've always done historically, and thinking about what that is. And so I know, uh, you know, we are pressed for time here, but I did want to put that into this conversation because many of the questions that you're asking are around how we're addressing needs that are different and new for us today. And we need to do that with our teachers um, and with our community members and parents. And we need to do it in a very, very thoughtful way. And so that's, you know, what uh, Dr. Collins and Ms. Wiles have have been able to frame. And so I, I think this conversation goes even beyond this budget because there are going to be many implications for it. So just to recap, Dr. McKnight, this is a special education. You're taking a fresh look at how we provide the services um, in order to improve uh, the delivery of services to the students in our reality. That's right. So yes. We'll Thank you, Mr. Bester. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. sure. Very good. So if we can move on to um, chapter two, school support and well-being. Thank you. I am going to um, open up um, in the Office of School Support and Well-Being. We focus on operationalizing the Board of Education's priorities and strategic plan. And the administrative staff in our office, including the associate superintendents, the directors of school support and well being, and the learning and achievement specialists, have the privilege of working closely with our principals and with their staff to build their instructional leadership capacity um, with a special focus on engaging staff through an anti racist lens. And the strong instructional and adaptive leadership is really needed to address the array of challenges. The, the demands of the principalship are great and particularly in the times in which we live. And I'm going to uh, repeat and often heard now saying that one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Peter Moran stated at one time and that is having been a principal is not the same as being a principal now. So as we work with schools to, uh, it's to focus on addressing their school improvement plan. That's a major focus. We work on creating the conditions in our schools that's necessary for every student to experience academic excellence. And it's by developing and implementing then the um, professional learning, uh, providing a comprehensive and coordinated programs and ser services, and focus on uh, learning accountability and results. And it really is, how do we live out MCPS's theory of action? If we differentiate resources, build staff capacity to create anti-racist learning environments, in which all students can learn and thrive and consistently utilize structures of accountability, then student outcomes will improve. So we stated in, um, well, first of all, let me go back. We, we then provide then aligned services that differentiated support for our schools in order to facilitate expert teaching and learning and leadership that is going to enable our uh, students, our teachers and our leaders to thrive. So we talked earlier in chapter one about the significant 
gaps that we have in opportunity and in um, achievement and how that falls most heavily on our Black students, our Hispanic students, um, our emerging multilingual uh, learners and students who's, uh, fam who are impacted by poverty. Um, as we walk through uh, this chapter of the budget, you're going to see the elements of school improvement planning, um, principal coaching and supervision, um, behavioral health, family and student engagement, um, aspects of the staff development teacher support through the learning achievement specialist and professional learning K to 12, all of which is in service to the um, MCPS pathway to college career and community readiness. So at this time, I am going to um, pass it off to uh, Damon Monteleone, the uh, one of the associate superintendents in the Office of School Support and Wellbeing, who is going to um, speak with, with us in depth about uh, various well-being and student services. Mr. Monte Leon. Thank you, Dr. Kimball, and uh, you know, greetings, board members, President Silvestre, uh, Superintendent McKnight. Um, yeah, as has been shared, I will be presenting an overview of Chapter 2, specifically as it relates to the programs, activities, and services that support students' physical, social, and emotional well-being from pre-K through graduation. Um, we know, right, uh, that in order for students to achieve their, their highest potential and reach academic success, they've got to feel safe, they've got to feel supported, they have to feel welcome at school and have these positive, productive relationships with their fellow students, their teachers, their administrators, and school staff. Uh, our students need to be able to develop skills to manage their emotions and know where help is if indeed they need it. Um, furthermore, we've got to continue to build on our work to engage our parents and our communities through an anti-racist lens as we move from simply informing them to engaging them um, in the process. Uh, just for a brief overview for you and the public, um, as, associate, as one of the associate superintendents of schools, um, in school support and well-being, uh, I oversee uh, the Division of Pupil, Personnel, and Attendance Services, um, Student Well-Being and Achievement, Student and Family Services, Psychological Services, um, the Department of Student Engagement, Behavioral Health, and Academics, uh, Student Leadership and Extracurriculars, Athletics, and the Office of International Admissions and Enrollment. And embedded throughout this chapter, and in alignment with our vision, you will hear um, really a theme of how we are committed to reinforcing the wellness infrastructure that was um, enhanced during the pandemic years. And so, as we know, well-being is one of the district's core priorities. Um, you'll hear about some select funding that is being moved to the base budget off of ESSER uh, to ensure that we can continue to enhance the data-driven structures and processes that we have put into place to differentiate those resources uh, for our students who need them most. Um, so a couple of the key places that I will speak to have to do with uh, the strategic realignment, as well as the accelerators with regard to our psychologists, uh, some of our mental health co contracts with external providers, um, our sort of justice specialists, uh, and specifically our social workers. Um, as we look at the broad overview here of chapter two, um, we can see like uh, many of most of our chapters here, 89% of the overall budget um, in, in this chapter is going towards our salaries and wages, right? So this is uh, to follow up with our, our agreements with the associations um, and certainly uh, for our outstanding workforce to continue the, the great work that they are doing uh, for our students. Uh, next slide, please. So first we're gonna start off and, and speak to some of the realignments. Again, these are budget neutral moves. These are budget neutral. Um, and these realignments have been made to more effectively allocate our human resources uh, to meet the evolving needs of the district and our students. Um, so one of the first pieces that you will see on here uh, that an instructional specialist position is being uh, realigned um, from, uh, from the uh, Learning and Achievement Specialist Office that is underneath uh, Dr. Kimball. Uh, and that position will be reallocated over to Chapter uh, 6 to support the Office of uh, Strategic Initiatives and to further implement district-wide professional learning. 
Um, with regards to the Division of Psychological Services, um, funds are being realigned a foreign office assistant uh, position. Given that this role has been a temporary part-time position for well over a decade, um, and in collaboration with our SEIU partners, moving to a per permanent position demonstrates the value of this role. Uh, and this role in particular uh, coordinates and manages all the psychological testing data and the records in compliance with law. Um, and finally, um, the Student Family Support and Engagement Coordinator uh, we are uh, realigning some funds from an instructional specialist position uh, to create a coordinator position in that office. Um, and that is significant due to the evolving scope of work in that office. This coordinator will help lead the transformation of that office from primarily supporting individual families um, and parents to being a central part of not only the student well-being team, but developing and implementing a series of school-based professional learning um, sessions for staff to better engage parents through an anti-racist lens. Next slide, please. So here we have some efficiencies and reductions that we are removing uh, from uh, the budget moving forward. Um, the first one is a 1.0 coordinator position. Uh, this is the coordinator of organizational development, which is an AP level, currently uh, re reports directly to Dr. Kimball. Uh, being a coordinator level, this position uh, was then this person or this role would easily be able to support schools at the AP level or other offices where a coordinator position is available. We have the five instructional specialist positions. Those are learning and achievement uh, specialist positions, which are being reduced so that those positions can directly support students uh, in the form of teaching positions and staff in schools. Um, there is a 1.0 office assistant position that is currently vacant uh, that is being reduced, as well as a 1.0 fiscal assistant position that is currently vacant and being reduced. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Continuing with more efficiencies and reductions um, to meet the parameters of our current budget, um, again, these reductions are able to be taken based on some of our programmatic priorities, operational efficiencies, position vacancies, and prior year expenditures. Um, so these are really specific to some of the, the well-being and support work, which falls under my purview. Um, so the first one here is a 1.0 administrative secretary one position. Um, this is a position that uh, has just recently been hired over the last six or seven months. Uh, and this role coordinates and processes stipends uh, and supports with financial paperwork. Um, one of the key aspects of this role had been to uh, process the leader in me uh, training stipends, but with the reduction in that program, um, we will need to take that as well as some of the other work and distribute it across uh, the remaining administrative staff. Um, other efficiencies and reductions uh, include within the Department of Student Engagement, Behavioral Health and Academics, uh, you will see an, a 0.8 instructional specialist position. This is uh, a mindfulness coordinator um, that has mainly been supporting highly impacted elementary schools uh, through professional development work. Uh, we anticipate carrying out more, uh, continuing this work through many of our wellness trainers that are in community schools and through the work of our restorative uh, justice unit. Uh, below that, you'll see a, a Department of Psychological Services. We currently have a 0.2 school psych position uh, that is vacant, which we are reducing, um, which has not been filled. And then we have the Student, Family, and School Services uh, Communications Assistant position. Um, this position being reduced um, that has pr uh, previously helped coordinate graphics and website development. This work will need to be shouldered by the staff and SFSC as well as through um, our collaboration with the communications office. Next slide, please. So here's some key, um, some key pieces here that, that we've heard about through our, our engagement with our stakeholders. Um, and these are expenditures, right, that we are shifting from ESSER 3, right, to our current operating budget. And I'd like, uh, please, if I can remind the board to keep in mind that these funds include, I, include items that we shifted from the local budget to ESSER last spring for one year only, as well as positions that were created solely through ESSER during the pandemic, right? So with respect to the uh, items that are, 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 were shifted from the base budget to ESSER for one year only for FY24, 
that's 4,471,127 uh, dollars worth of the funds here. Um, uh, included in that would be 20 psych psychologist positions at just over $2 million. Um, moving forward on this, you have 142,554 to fund a 1.0 supervisor position. That is the super the social worker supervisor position. Uh, that supervisor uh, supports our entire social worker unit, providing services K through 12, including the 25 permanent social workers in each of our uh, comprehensive high schools. Uh, you have the, the 32 social work positions that are funded by ESSER, as well as those previously mentioned uh, psychologist positions. Um, oh, just for one year only, we had to move uh, 19 parent community coordinator positions off of the base budget and over to ESSER to meet this year's budget requirement. Those are being put back on the base budget to continue those services. Um, additionally, we have our sort of justice specialists, six of whom um, that are being moved over to the base budget to continue the outstanding work that they have done in helping reduce overall suspensions, um, create uh, inclusive, welcoming, warm environments, and specifically bring down suspensions of our African-American students in select uh, middle schools where they have been allocated. Um, finally, we have uh, the $300,000 so we can continue to reinforce the work that we're doing um, with uh, college tracks so that we can meet our, our uh, strategic priority of ensuring our students are community, uh, career, and college ready. Um, can move on to the next slide. And then we do have a few accelerators. So the first accelerator here um, has to do with three additional Director 2 positions. And those are Director 2 positions while they are in Chapter 2, uh, most of which does fall under my purview. These three director positions are your traditional school supervisory directors um, that would be uh, placed within the purview of my three colleagues, my associate su superintendent uh, brothers and sisters who supervise schools along with, with Dr. Uh, Kimball. Uh, this is based on an extensive amount of research, which indicates that the lower the caseload of schools for a director, uh, the more quality of the coaching that we can provide and oversight for our principals. Um, currently, many of our directors are at 19, 20, and 21 schools uh, for each of their caseloads, and the research indicates that 13 to 15 schools is an optimal number. Um, we should keep in mind the really high number of uh, novice principals that we have, as well as the, the, the numbers of acting, right, uh, and interim uh, principals that, that we have at this time. So that coaching and support is needed more than ever. And finally, here we have um, one supervisor position. This is a supervisor that uh, uh, that that coordinates work within the office of or in the in the restorative justices unit. This supervisor has been instrumental um, in bringing down our suspensions of close to 500 year to date uh, this this school year compared to last year, and in working uh, to be strategic about the allocation of our restorative justice specialists uh, into select middle schools, where we've seen a dramatic increase. Um, in, in suspensions there. Uh, so happy to, to field questions amongst any of these items. Um, and I believe we are going to the next slide, which is discussion. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I have two questions to just get us started. Um, we have, you mentioned some um, social emotional supports. But we also have contracts with nonprofits to provide therapy services. Um, I'd like to know what the to total dollar amount is for uh, that very important work that we are doing to bring uh, in-person therapy to our schools. And the other question is about restorative justice. I'd like to get a better idea of the whole program. Like, do you have a work chart or staffing? Like, all the positions, what do they do? We are fully implementing now restorative justice, correct? Just that different schools are at different stages of implementation. But I just I just want to have the the full picture of what restorative justice staffing looks like in our schools and, and what they do. And I know that's not something that you can explain. I could I probably need to see it visually uh, to understand it. Does that make sense? It makes complete sense, and we do have that available for for folks to see. And I, I just, I, I will touch upon the the contractual services question first. 
Um, but I, I don't want to lose this thought, right? I want to remind everybody that that restorative justice and restorative approaches is an is an ethos, if you will. It's a philosophy. It's a way of approaching everything that we do in schools. Um, and we often refer to it as a program, um, but it really is an approach to building positive school climates um, and and uh, and and engaging with students. Um, and I will be and I will speak to that in just one moment. With respect to your question, President Silvestre, about um, the contractual services. So we currently have 1.6 million uh, dollars that we are allocating to both uh, Jessa and Thrive. Those are um, mental health, uh, some of our mental health partners. Um, so as a result of uh, these contractual services, uh, we are providing direct therapeutic service to schools, um, 68 schools. Uh, that had not received these direct therapeutic services in the past. These are primarily elementary and middle schools. These are schools that have been identified based on a variety of data points, need elevated by principals, as well as what those in the mental health world refer to as mental health deserts, right? One example I can give you, I was out at John Poole Middle School a couple weeks ago um, and worked with the principal there and their, their Thrive psychologist was in her office. The door was shut. There were student, There was a student in there. Uh, they had they had a, a sign on the door, and I was told by that principal that that therapist uh, that that psychologist has about twenty five kids on her caseload. So that's one example of that work that's going on. Um, the data that I have handy for you in terms of impact is that three hundred and thirty three students uh, across those sixty eight schools this school year are receiving direct service. As of as uh, as of now, with respect to um, the question about restorative um, uh, restorative uh, justice, um, so we have we have our restorative justice specialists that are um, aligned or or have cohorts of schools that they support, right? Similar to the way that you would have, um, you know, in in the curriculum world, where your reading specialists or your math specialists have certain schools that that they support. Um, and so they work with those those schools on a front end basis, right, to provide training and professional development um, as needed. Um, there's a number, you know, a very variety of data that that I could speak to in terms of of, of what they're doing, um, what our implementation data has shown, right? We created an implementation rubric and a framework in alignment with the state of Maryland last year, um, and according to uh, the evaluation, 90% of the schools have begun implementation. There are 20 schools that we're referring to as reactive, um, and I could get into more of the data, but those reactive schools are where we are focusing our differentiated support to get them along the continuing to be to be fully, to have full implementation. Um, along the work that our, these folks have done, um, you know, our EML suspensions are down 3%, um, yep. so on and so forth, sure. Yep. Yep. Um, Thank you. I appreciate the explanation about the um, the specialist. And if you could just outline what the other positions are and uh, what they do, and if there's um, if you could help me understand the investment um, dollars, that would be helpful as well. The position, what a position generally costs. Okay, so a position, and again, I I would look to my my budget partners here to step in, but a position is is essentially a teaching position, right? So your instructional instructional specialist position is would be uh, the same as a teaching position. Um, so whatever that average value is per staff. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, I'm going to move on to Mr. Saeed. And um, just in the interest of time, I just ask my colleagues to ask succinct questions and the staff to be as succinct as possible in your responses. Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, President Silvestre. And you actually hit one of my questions uh, about the specialist, so that's great. So, um, Mr. Monsignoni, I, I really love all the work you're doing here. I mean, as you know, this part of the uh, county's work really does excite me. Um, on the topic of restorative justice, I kind of want to know a little more about the RJ coaches that I know we have in schools, which is basically, you know, teacher staff that are given stipends. I was looking through the budget. I couldn't find anything specifically on them. So can you talk a little bit about the work we're continuing to do? Are they still getting the same amount of stipends? Do we have the same amount of coaches? Are we uh, increasing, decreasing? Like, what does that program look like? Sure. So there's about 400,000 in stipends, which we have 
um, you know, move forward, right? And so there is a restorative justice coach in all 211 schools. They receive a stipend similar to an athletic coach. Um, and uh, again, either maybe Rob or Yvonne or Sean Kay can hop on, but I, we did reduce um, the, the stipend amount in alignment with, with the, you know, the, the mandate for a 10% reduction. Um, it's currently on ESSER. We wanted to bring that over to the, to the base budget. We reduced, I believe, the the stipends at the elementary schools by two thousand each. I believe it's about four thousand per coach right now. Um, I don't have those numbers in front of me. That's off the top of my head. Uh, and these coaches are um, are used in a variety of ways by the different principals, right? But they are the boots on the ground. They are the school expert. Uh, they meet consistently with um, the the supervisor that you saw on the last slide for an accelerator and our restorative justice specialists to align the work um, across all 211 schools. In many schools of best practices, those coaches work directly with staff development teachers um, in, in terms of the, the school learning progression, because we're, we, yes, we're focused on teaching and learning and pedagogy, but we're also focused on that warm, nurturing and trauma-informed learning environment as well. And that's where the RJ coaches uh, come into play at the school level. Okay, perfect. And I know, of course, you know, this year is a tough year. So it makes sense that we're kind of cutting some money there. But I'm hoping in the future, we can continue continually expand that. Um, so I also want to ask about um, kind of the the I think this was what President Sylvester was touching on. Let me know if it is if this was already answered. But I think it's the specifically uh, the telehealth services that we provide the 1.6 million. Was that what President Sylvester was talking about earlier? Yeah, that, that is that. And I, I wanted just to clarify this for, for you, Mr. Saeed, and for the board and the community is that we we originally, during the pandemic, referred to these services as telehealth because that's where we were during the pandemic. Okay, These I see. are not solely telehealth services. And in fact, the majority of the services that are provided are in person. Um, I just gave the example of John Poole, right? And so... Um, uh, we have, you know, research and 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 the industry has found that you know telehealth services, while while pragmatic, right, and available and and a, a great equalizer, are not always the best uh, medium for for therapeutic services. And so, um, uh, the a majority of our services are being performed uh, in person by uh, by our contractual providers. Okay, perfect. I was just making sure that that was already touched upon because I and thanks for addressing the confusion between telehealth and in person because that I know is something I was a little confused about. And then one last short question. Um, so in the beginning of the, the slides when we introduced school support and well being, I saw I think it was referring to $100,000 um, for cell phone support um, under contractual services. I kind of want to know a little bit more what 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 that is. What does that mean? Great question. So um, we have contractual agreements, right, with MCAP, and so we have contractual agreements for which staff, which leadership staff uh, have MCPS cell phones. And so each of the offices within, um, within central office, right, and then certainly for our school principals as well, uh, each office has a budget for cell phones, right? So uh, my MCPS cell phone, my directors, things of that nature, and we have to maintain, um, you know, these, these contracts and payments. Okay, sounds good. That's it for me. Thank you. Mrs. Nondrowski? Yep, thank you. Um, <clears throat> just to really quickly, can you just explain to me, you know, two years ago, um, you know, the board and MCPS, we really were emphasizing the importance of the career pathways and um, very supportive of that. Um, are we removing? that program? And are we removing those staff supports? Um, I'm asking because I, my understanding is it has been very successful. And um, I'm just curious where that's coming from. Is that in the HR chapter? It's in this chapter, I believe. So I we will I believe Brian the Hall. advice and it's going to be in chapter four in the instruction or curriculum program programs. Okay, so now I wait till chapter four because before you guys said chapter two. I, I can just answer that real quick, I think. Um, so the program is not going away. We did as part of these you know, budget reductions need to um, 
you know, remove a couple of positions that, that directly support it. And so the work that's going on right now is identifying, you know, who will pick that work up, how it will be done, but all of the tuition reimbursement money and the program itself uh, remains intact and remains a very important part of our um, talent pipeline. Okay. And I am very excited about the um, additional uh, directors that you all are putting in. I think it's critical that all of our principals and whatever have those kind of supports and they do have a huge workload currently. So I'm very appreciative of that. But I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm, I am concerned a little bit about the instructional specialist positions that are being reduced, five of them. Um, and it, I mean, I'm just curious, like the price tag on it doesn't seem um, excessive. So is there not anywhere else we can come up with the funds to be able to keep those supports directly in our schools or no? I don't okay. know, Dr. Kimball, I'm not sure. To, I'll say, I was trying to, I, I'm sorry. I, was so trying. I just wanted to say something about that and then the staff can jump in. I think when we look at the budget, um, and first of all, thank you, Ms. Madrowski, for making that point, because in terms of increasing the principal supervision, I think we've all had a front row seat this year to really looking at why that becomes critically important that we have the number of schools that principal supervisors can really dig in and become a part of to understand. So first, I want to thank you for, for saying that, because I think, and, and even with this investment, I'm going to say, we're not completely there, given the number. <laughs> yeah, given the number that the Wallace Foundation recommends. Mm -hmm. Now, with that said, I think what well, I know what the team has done with this is really looked at where do we have duplication of services, right? So when we think about our specialists, they absolutely have been key and very supportive in making some connection to uh, the work that we do with the school improvement plan and supporting their teams. But at the same time, given the right ratio we should have, that's a, a significant part of the work that the principal supervisors should be doing as the people who really talk about the impact of that stu principal supervision on student learning and other components. And then with that said, we're also acknowledging that we have a number of other positions that provide school support in the way that you know supports them with school improvement planning and all of those pieces that our specialists have also done. So, you know, this is really about looking at how we can be thoughtful of the level of services that are provided and what it is that we want the schools to have and where do we already, already have that support to better utilize the resources that we have. So, I, I, I yeah. No, I, I appreciate that. I mean, that that's helpful to me. So, thank you. Sure. Did you have other questions, Mrs. Madrowski? No, okay. Ms. Harris, Ms. Yang, and I think I saw Mrs. Evans' hands up. Go ahead, Ms. Harris. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Monteleone, a question looking at slide um, 43, when you outlined the positions that the 84 FTEs that either had always been uh, funded through ESSER or were moved from the base budget to ESSER last in the this current FY24 budget cycle. Are all of those FTEs listed on that slide currently filled? So looking, I'm looking at multiple, because your, your slide number 42 is something that different than at 43. No, 43. 43, got it, okay. So in looking at these positions, um, so no, the, the, the short answer is no, and that's what they fall under the psychologists, right? As you all are aware, we've had just like many, um, most institutions and organizations, uh, we're facing the, 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 the staffing challenges in the labor market, hiring full-time psychs. I will say, however, that we only have 16.2 vacancies in, um, in our, in, uh, with respect to MCPS psychologists. This is reduced by just about half since last year. Um, and a lot of that is due to the increased entry step. We move that up to a, a step five in collaboration with our uh, MCEA partners. And we also provided the step five 
raise to all those higher within the last two years. So that was really a win for us in partnership with MCA last year. Um, with respect, if you want to dive deeper into those vacancies, 12.2 out of the 16.2 are in the Division of Psychological Services in our shop. Um, in the Office of Special Education, um, we have in our PEP or preschool education program, we have one vacancy uh, in SESES or Social Emotional Special Education Services. We have four psychological uh, psychologist vacancies and we have one in Bridge. And so what, when I speak to psychological services, I speak to all the psych positions because Dr. Uh, Connolly Chester supervises and evaluates the, all psychologists across the district, but they are in several shops and offices uh, across the district. Okay, so this these are positions, these aren't um, like chronic long-term unfillable positions that that we have sort of just said, we're, we're moving those to contractual services like uh, we were talking about special ed. So these are ones that um, that we we need and intend to fill. A absolutely. They're not filled already. A absolutely. And, and Ms. Harris, okay. if I can just say that we would not, in, in our mind, right, we would not want to reduce these even though they are not filled because we know that every single school needs needs to have that psych allocated. And right now we have a coverage plan in place to provide services to schools. Um, but were we to reduce these positions and then have the uh, the the candidates available, we wouldn't want to shortchange our students. And I also want to say that we did reduce from I think close to thirty last year to sixteen this year in the vacancies. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And then a uh, quick question: I, I get some of these um, programs a little bit confused because there are some similarities, um, college track aces that kind of thing. But is college tracks the program that is through MC or is it aces that is MC? Um, through MC. Okay, so so college tracks. This is a different program or different company, and is this to expand that program into additional high schools? For college tracks. Yes. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's it's provide additional high schools and um, and and ACES is, is to be expanded as well into middle school. So it's really a combination of the two, but the intent is to provide more students with these services as a as an equity lever between the two of them. Okay. And so I, I don't expect anybody to know this now, but I it would be I would like to know at some point which schools we're gonna we're looking to to uh, increase those services to or move into with those services. Um, and I did just, uh, first of all, I did want to say I very much appreciate the work to look intensively at efficiencies and find areas of work that are redundant. Um, it's unavoidable in a, in, a, in a workforce our size that there would not be some redundancy somewhere, but I really do appreciate that as, a, as, a, as an effective strategy to, um, to, to move us to a better place fiscally. Um, and then I did just want to associate myself with Mrs. Smondrowski's comments about the the recommendation to add three new director positions. Um, I've recently been doing a lot of reading um, from Meredith Honig, who is a this is her area of work out of the University of Washington. How you know central offices support schools because if you don't have a successful principal, you don't have a successful school. And uh, I mean that's the work that is the work of central offices. And so I really do I do appreciate that. I think that's essential. If I could, um, Ms. Harris, I just want to, uh, I did get some information here from from, from some folks on my team. So the, the college tracks is to be expanded in five schools. Um, and I also just want to correct something I said earlier, where all of the psych positions that are being moved um, are currently filled, right? That are moving back are filled. We do have 16 vacancies total from before. Okay, and we are still moving forward with those vacancies in anticipation of filling them. But the ones coming back are all filled. Okay? Thank you, Pam. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Ms. Yang, and then Mrs. Evans, and then Mr. Verado. Yes, good afternoon again. Um, this is uh, very helpful for us to understand the uh, central office support for our schools. Um, I would uh, like to have a little bit more understanding about our uh, um, the instructional specialist position, which we call learning 
uh, achievement specialist. I believe that is the position that was created last year, uh, 25 of them. Now, uh, before we see the event, and it was created last year because um, we said there wasn't enough support. We would like to provide more support for our school administrations. So this position was created. It's a brand new ad, ad last year. Now this year, we're switching to from 25 to 19. And, um, and at what point can we see a evaluation or have a better understanding of what the role of this position and its impact in supporting our school administrators. Um, that's, uh, uh, that's what I would like to see. And in this chapter, uh, we under the, at the page 11, we are talking about strategic priority. And I appreciate seeing that we have a one point coordinator position to help with our 504 plans. Can you help me understand, because I understand this is under ESSER fund, but we have created more position to help 504 plan um, under ESSER. Are we only moving one over? How is the work going to be continue? As we know that we have doubled the 504 cases from, this is the support we're talking about for the counseling, from 2017 to 20, for last school year, we doubled. 2017 is about 4,500 cases. Right now we are at 5,400 cases. So um, can someone just help me understand that a bit? Ms. Yang, I'll sure. take the first part of your question. Oh, it looks like my, Mr. Monteleone is ready for the second one. Uh, but I just wanted to take the first. It was such a great question, and I'm so glad you asked it. So a part of what we've had to do with this budget, knowing that this was going to be the Esther Cliff, was evaluate what everybody's role was and how it's working in concert. So if you ask the question about the specialist, of course, the specialist role has been one that is key and pivotal. And as you can see, we've actually kept um, many of those positions and, and have cut some. However, I directed the, the staff, and I know there's been some transition since then, but this summer to really take a deep dive in looking at what positions are doing what to support school, school improvement plan, and how they're supporting the principalship. And so that specialist position, which has been one that is, that I believe was put into OSSWB, if I am not mistaken, I want to say it was in 20... 13, 2015, somewhere around that time frame, and now just kind of evaluating how close do we want the principal supervisors to be, what responsibilities did we delegate to the specialists that need to be with them, and what needs to be with the principal supervisor is exactly what we're doing. So I, I suggest that we actually come back to even talk about that you know, as we've, you know, done done some initial work around understanding what everybody's doing to one, be become more fiscally responsible. And secondly, to not have duplication of services um, around what it is that we're expecting the staff to do. So, and, and to Ms. Harris's point, we have been reading much research and actually worked with Meredith Honig personally around this. I mean, she was one of the first ones that came in um, and shared with us, you know, you really got to look at your principal supervision model and what is it that you want them doing? And then going back to all these other positions that you have, what do they need to be doing? And really asking the question, do you need all of it? And so that that is exactly what we're doing. So Ms. Yang, wonderful question. That's the work that we are doing right now. And I think this budget really looks at how we are moving towards a better understanding of that. But I did want to acknowledge that that's work that's not even uh, fully complete. And a part of it is evaluating the effectiveness of uh, those positions. I appreciate that, Dr. Manai. I'm looking at my book, chapter two, page six, and 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 uh, it shows the the FT changed uh, from FY twenty three to FY twenty five. 
So if we create new position, so I will really appreciate the evaluation, right? Yes. So uh, 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 of um, we want support, like you said, what kind of support, how effective of our, our support has been. So, so yeah, I look forward to seeing that, um, that um, evaluation. And Dr. Collins, if we could just note as a follow-up to what Ms. Yang just said, working with uh, OSA on when and how do we bring that back to the board? Thank you. I know you had a second part of the question that Mr. Monteleone was ready to address. Certainly. Uh, sorry about jumping the gun there, Dr. McKnight. So I, I think to your point, Ms. Yang, about um, assessing the impact, right, of what we've done. Um, so yeah, with regard to the 504 support, uh, we did add um, uh, three positions to, to support directly uh, with schools regarding 504s uh, through ESSER in this current budget, right? Um, so we do have uh, a coordinator of 504, um, and we did have uh, uh, two additional instructional specialist positions. Due to the need to cut close to 10% uh, off of um, my office's budget, we've reduced that to one specialist and one coordinator, right? We would love to be able to keep them all, but again, I think we're talking, as Dr. Knight has said, we're talking about prioritization here. Uh, we'd love to have everything, but we need to prioritize. I do want to say, even with the increase in numbers that you cited with regard to 504, one of the main charges of this new unit was to um, work directly with schools to assess the operational efficiency of how they process the, the 504 paperwork and to increase operational efficiency um, and to provide direct support and to be in schools running the meetings when we are short of uh, counselors or where we only have one counselor in an elementary school. These folks are in the buildings. And so as a result of this work, uh, the number of elementary schools with greater than 5% of the Section 504 plans out of compliance went from 39% to 28% so far this year. With respect to middle schools that had a greater than 5% Section 504 plans out of compliance at the middle school level, we went from 55% where we're currently at 45%. At the high school level, from 61% to 42%. Now, we know those numbers aren't where we want them to be, but we are seeing substantive um, gains uh, in, in reducing uh, out of compliance 504s uh, with that support. And that um, is, as, you, as you've mentioned, that is allowing our counselors to be able to provide more direct services when we can, can um, support the 504 paperwork. So, Mr. Montanoni, the data is so amazing. So, we we on. I would rather as spend money on the front end, provide good services for our special education families, complying with with the uh, what's required for us to do. Then at the back end, that anything end up in litigation. Let's just be honest here. So you mentioned elementary school was able to reduce 11%, right? Middle school, we are able to reduce 10%. Yep. And then high school, we are able to reduce all 19%. That's yes. a significant increase of our capacity in serving our special education family. So I would really like us to think hard, if we reduce the staff members that are currently doing this work, that what would it do to impact, will we, to impact the services, right? Uh, and are we, will we be able to continue to bend the trend the way we have been bending it? Um, so I, I would like us to think about that. I, I, I'm done with my comment, Madam President. Thank you. Mrs. Evans. Sure. So, uh, Ms. Yang, we were in sync in terms of your first question that you asked. Um, what I was going to state is in, you know, quite a few budgets prior to now, we had really supported, um, 
increasing learning achievement specialist. So I do appreciate the comments that I heard from Dr. McKnight, as well as Mr. Monteleon about what that work is going to look like. So my question was going to be, what are we going to do that's going to be different as a result of not having a specialist in there? But I also wanted to just speak to being able to have the opportunity to be able to see the learning achievement specialist in action in in conjunction with the director, that now we will be looking to ensure that our principals are going to be really eff effective in supporting and providing the extra support to our teachers. So what can we expect or look for in the area of um, how we will continue to support our principals to ensure that they can turn around and provide that support to our teachers in the classroom? Ms. Evans, our teacher, our principals will continue to get the support. So with us moving from 25 learning and achievement specialists to 19, we're changing the caseload. So where in now we have a one to nine ratio, it's going to move to a one to 13 ratio. And we very much appreciate the work that they do in terms of focusing on the school improvement plan and work looking at that through. Um, anti-racist lens and also working to build the capacity of um, other staff in the building. And as Dr. McKnight was saying, um, it really is uh, wonderful that we, we need to look at all of the um, individuals who we have who are providing supports to our schools. And for example, one partnership that we're uh, Dr. Peggy Pugh and I are now laugh about the fact that we don't want to be engaged. We want to be married because the folks in her office, in terms of curriculum, it's really critical that we work closely together. The first question that we ask is, what do we want students to know and be able to do? So as the staff in our office, the learning achievement specialists, directors and associates uh, work, uh, with schools, it is in conjunction with specialists in the curriculum office to look at providing standards-based instruction. So um, the caseload is going to increase. It's not that those supports will no longer uh, be available. It's wonderful support, and we do always want to build the capacity as the LAS's work to build the capacity of the staff development um, teachers and, and support the other team. Okay. Thank I, you. I agree wholeheartedly with what Dr. Kimball said. And thank you, Dr. Kimball, for clarifying that caseload because I think that's the focus moving forward. I wanted to, you know, you, you mentioned this, Ms. Evans, because you're right. Some years ago, I'm sure there was advocacy for the LAS position um, I know Mr. Moran has been here through those evolutions, you know, pretty much within the office. Um, and I did, you know, just want to double down on on that question, you know, from being in the office until, you know, when those positions were created up until the vision now. Any, any other thoughts, Mr. Uh, Moran, on the changes from then to now? Yeah, so uh, thank you, Dr. McKnight. I, I I think there just a couple of things I wanted to share. The the first is that um, in terms of how we are allocating resources and looking at our theory of action to differentiate them, when you're differentiating things, people don't all, all get the same thing. And so we need to go where the data is taking us. And it's not a one-to-one a -one where each cluster has one learning and achievement specialist. You could be deploying two in one place and none in, an, in another at certain times. The other component is our, our greatest resources are time. As a director, when I started, I had 25 schools. And you just don't feel like you're even getting a chance to get deep and, and, and really support the, the principal. Um, and we know through research that the that, that change and transformation flows through the principal. And then essentially that would mean that it flows through the principal supervisor. So the investment of time, if I can spend, you know, an additional five hours in a school per week or 20 hours in a month in a school, that investment will be more critical than an instructional specialist alone trying to do that work. So um, I just think it's important to look at the caseload and what we'd be able to do 
um, if that caseload was 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 brought down even four or five schools. Um, and the other component is that coming out of the pandemic, um, everyone really did need some of the same things. We're starting to stabilize and we're starting to see data move you know, up in certain places, and we're starting to see it also plateau in certain places. So the principal supervisor getting into those schools where we're seeing it plateau and planning themselves in there, really providing support, accountability, and coaching to those principals is what's going to move the dial, uh, you know, move the needle for us. I appreciate that because you know what, when you look at our budget book, all that what you all just said is not there. I know that we can go back to our appendices and see some of the details, but as we have a captivated audience, I would like for people to hear the work that we're doing in Montgomery County public school system that is intentional, that there has been a lot of thought behind it. And you just don't get that from reading the book. You get that from us asking the questions. Because I know that what you're doing, you're presenting it to us, but we want our community to hear and understand when they see these numbers, what they actually mean, and that they'll know that we're creating a, a system where our students can continue to thrive going forward as a result of the years that have you know, gone, come and gone, that we know that changes need to be made. So I just wanted to ask the question to just speak to what the board has asked for the system to put in the budget. And as we make changes, what those changes actually mean and what they look like. So I do know, Mr. Montesimil, I'm not taking away from you. I know you mentioned what the uh, what the number would look like, but Dr. Kimbo, you really gave a deep dive into what that looks like as well as Mr. Moran so that our community can better understand and know that what we're doing will work for our students in the future. So. And Miss e Evans, I just want to add to just for the the knowledge of the board, which I know that 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 you you know this, but one of the ways that we tried to minimize the caseload for directors was by giving associate superintendents schools. So our associate superintendents currently right now have between eight and ten schools, and essentially their ability to coach and supervise and drive the system work through the directors is impacted because. We've tried to decrease caseloads by giving the three associate superintendent schools. So I just think that's an important thing out there, which is is not a not a model that that you know is is ideal. No, oh, thank you. That helps me, and I'm sure it helps somebody else that's listening too. Thank you, Ms. Rivetta Oven and Ms. Wolf, and then we're going to move on to the next and final chapter for the day. Hey, thank you. No, actually. Um, some of my questions were already answered. I just have uh, a follow-up question on um, earlier on when uh, Mr. Uh, Monteleon was talking about the services that we contract, I believe was for mental health uh, with outside providers that it's an, an allocation of like $1.6 million for 60, 68 schools. Did I get that right? Yes. And that it serves 330 students or it served 330 students? Yeah, total between uh, combined between Jessa and Thrive. Yes. 232 um, with Jessa, 121 in Thrive. Um, yes. So that's an average of what about a little bit more than 5,000 per student? I I didn't do the math, but I'm I'm gonna tr trust your your math there. Not that great in <laughs> math. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and I I one thing I I just wouldn't want to say, and and I I would have to get this data right. So I actually do have some data in front of me, but uh, some of the, the the students that are receiving insure um that are receiving these services, and this is important. It's who's receiving the the the, the these services. So, for example, out of Jessa, we have 232 uh, students receiving the, the service, and the total number of students who utilize medical assistance is 107. All right, so that's an important number. While only 120 are are using the the the, the commercial insurance, and that's in Jessa. And then, if you look down at Thrive, um, 88 out of the 121 are utilizing some sort of medical assistance insurance to receive those services. And 17 students have no insurance whatsoever. Um, so part of that is factored into the, into the, the services we're providing. And I'm just curious to, to better understand, as Ms. Sebastian was saying, the kind of services that they are getting that otherwise we do not provide with any of our schools like, like RICA 
um, or any of those the schools that have some kind of component. So if you could get, if you could just share, you don't have to do it now, but share with us what what is that look like? That'd be great. Um, and the other question that I had was on page um, ten on the realignment of uh, funding under um, the left column when it's the international admissions and enrollment. There was a realignment of one hundred four thousand, and it was from staff training. Could you just kind of explain to me what what does that does that mean? Yeah, let me. I'm going to have to find my. But what which I, you said slide ten. I think my my slides are are in are, chapter ten in the big book. Chapter. So, I'm sorry. Which chapter? Two. Two. Yeah, and and then I don't. I have slides. She's talking about the budget book, not the slide deck. The budget yeah. book, okay, which I do not, unfortunately, have in front of me. Okay, you can get back to me. It, I'm just a little concerned and curious to know that I, I know we've been talking about staff training mm -hmm. or um, that we train our staff on how to deal with EML students. So I'm trying to understand why was that realigned for something else, if that makes sense. All right, I will. I will get that to you, and I'm. Sure, I bet you I will find that before we get off this call. I also just wanted to um, to be clear that on your your other question, Miss Rivera Oven, was to know the difference between the psychological services provided in special schools compared to the psychological services that are provided through our co contractual services. Was that your other question? Yep. Okay. Okay. And and I will I will get that the information on the um, the. Thank you. And then on the learning specialist, I just want to follow up. I'm just still not clear. I know why we did it, but still not clear why we did it at this time, at this point in time, when we just started putting in the learning specialist. And why did we, you know, why do we make that change now? Um, if there was somewhere else that we could have made that change and kept the 25 allocated specialists. I, and we had to change the intensity of support without losing the resource altogether. So we still have the support. We receive support through other offices as well. And the fact is that when uh, we are required to look at budget efficiencies, we have to make some tough decisions in a very tight budget year. Mm -hmm. Dr. Okay. Kimball, if I could, if I could just add, Ms. Rivera, Alvin, that just so you know that the learning and achievement specialists were implemented in FY uh, eighteen. So uh, the we're the, we're saying like it's a new it's a new position. It's actually in its its sixth year of uh of being implemented. Okay, but I guess during COVID, it, it's hard to measure. Sure. There was no insight since the kids were really not in school. So I'm just looking looking at it of how long it's really been implemented for. Um, and the last thing I have is on the accelerator that you guys have at the end to reduce, um, I guess, the representation of uh, black and brown kids in suspension rates and you are creating a, a supervision position for that. And my question is, is that for the whole, for the whole system? Is that person's gonna be overseen? And what and how what is that going to look like and whether that person is going to have support? Because it seems like a big um, undertaking for one person. Yeah, I'm going to I see you, Sean. OK, one second. Um, I just want to be clear that the that the the position that we're talking about has been in existence over the last couple of years through a CCEIS CEIS grant from the state of Maryland. It is because of the funding of this position that we were able to, to one of the, the reasons, in addition to many, many, many people doing a lot of hard work, this position was instrumental in helping us reduce uh, the disproportionality of suspensions, specifically for black and brown students and those receiving special education services um, at the middle school level. Um, and so this, this, we are now, because of the success that we've had, and again, we've reduced overall suspension in the district by close to 500, and where this, this supervisor has coordinated the work where we have put either a restorative justice specialist and or a social worker into a middle school for two days a week consistently throughout the year. When we have done that, we have seen a 41% reduction 
um, in suspensions of uh, African American students in those specific schools. So this supervisor will support that that work moving forward, um, and as well as uh, supervise all of the the work coming out of rest, uh, restorative justice and our Alt One level programs. But um, uh, Mr. Ambi is here as well to speak a little bit more specifically about that role. So the 30 second response is that, thank you so much, Damon. Um, it's not a created position, it's shifting. So it's shifting from one budget to another. So it used to be within the special education budget because it's very closely aligned to some of the work that um, Ms. Wiles talked about earlier. Uh, around some of our student behaviors that we're seeing. So it's an existing position. It's currently held by Carla Lopez Arias, and it's shifting from one budget to another. So it is not a new creation in this budget. It's existed in the last year as well. Okay, thank you for clarifying that because for me an accelerator is something, I guess I see it as something that is we're, something new that we're implementing or we're bringing to the table. So you're just shifting funding really. Y yes, yeah, so we have to I label it as an accelerator, right? Because it's coming from where it didn't exist in the base budget. It was from a state grant. And now we want to move it to the base budget because we've seen a lot of impact come out of that role. And, and before we, I, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say, but we don't have anything like that in high school. This is specifically just for middle school. No, it's, it's for the entire district, but a lot of the focus of the work that we have done because our our suspension numbers are per capita um, extreme at the middle school level. Um, that is where we've allocated the resource and we've seen a big bang for the buck. And, and if you did want me to now, and I don't want to take more time, I can also speak to the IE reductions that you raised um, before, but I don't know if that's for now or later. Can I just add one clarification? Um, because RICA is going back to your question about support and services to RICA. RICA is significantly different in terms of programming than our other schools. So any any position we don't provide to RICA is because they have a specific program that they use with their clinical staff that doesn't require us to provide a school psychologist, a social worker, um, or or those other positions. Um, they want to stay true to how they provide those services because some of the students are residential there. So right. they provide those wraparound services. Okay. Thank you. Mrs. Ms. Wolf. Yeah, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I too am a little bit concerned about the learning achievement specialists. I, I think if I'm out in the public, what people see is that we create stuff one year and then a few years later, we're getting rid of it. And there, it's not clear as to why. I hear you say intensity of support, but am I mistaken? I didn't hear that you had actually done an evaluation of this position. So that was my first question. My second is, are they technically going away for good or are they being repurposed somewhere in the system? Thomas, well, I'll, well, Luke, yes. I want to address a couple of things. So what we've seen in the history of um, our Office of School Support and Wellbeing is oftentimes many of the changes that have happened that led into creation of positions or different positions happen as a result of reorganizations. And what we know is we you, you can't reorganize yourself out of looking at what the true needs are. I went back to uh, 20, I should say it was 2015, 2016, because I was actually not in OSSWB, but I was a secondary director when the, when the position first came um, or when there was conversation about how we needed to have additional supports in schools for school improvement. What we are doing first as the first layer of this is trying to reduce the number of principal supervisors. Ms. Uh, um, Harris alluded to this and a number of others. We know through all the research that has that is out there that we do not have the principal supervision number at what it needs to be to one, properly work alongside 
and supervise principals appropriately. And I think this has led to us taking an immediate step to make sure we remedy that and furthermore clarify exactly what these positions are to do. Now, your question about the evaluation of the LASs, what we have done, what the team has done is looked and they, you know, at first glance, you see a duplication of services. Earlier when uh, Ms. Madrowski brought this up about the ERS study and in our work with Ms. Honick and others, one of the first questions they ask us, you have all these positions, what is it that you want people to do? And so the first step is looking at the crossover of we have all these positions, but we need clarity around what impact, and that's why the evaluation becomes important, have we seen as a result of that? And that is not complete. But what we ultimately know is we must right now decrease the number of uh, supervision, the number of principal supervisors that are assigned to a school for an enormous amount of data that we've seen, felt, and have experienced. And in the process of doing that, we're trying to, we're remedying that part. But we're also continuing to look at whether it's LESs and a number of other positions, how is their replication of that? So that's why earlier when Ms. Yang asked, you know, the question very similar to this, I said, this is a larger conversation that we want to come back to centered in the evaluation of what we've seen about some of these programs, because a part of it is what has been the effectiveness of it. But the second question is truly, how is there duplication of services? You know, in some years we've had, and I must say the last few years we've had a number of, you know, much padding in which we could in some cases have duplication of services and have different services when we had the ESSER money, we just don't have that anymore. And so Ms. Wolf, you're right. Centering the evaluation in this and really looking at duplication of services and why is a deeper conversation we wanna go into. Yeah, I appreciate that. I just think that that has to be clear to the public because it looks as though you're layering on more central office staff and removing. And I know that they're not school-based technically, but they service the schools and that's what people know. Mm -hmm. So I just think that when you do go and have to describe this further, you need to be very clear as to why you're changing. Um, because I've sat through this now, I don't know how long, cause I'm really brain dead, but <laughs> it took me a while to understand that you hadn't technically evaluated it, but that you wanted to change the level of support. And I think that that, as, as Ms. Evans said, that really didn't come through to me. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Mr. Monteleone. Uh, yeah, up? thank you so much. I, I did want to just address um, uh, Ms. Rivera Oven asked a question about the 104,000 in IE being realigned. Um, and so this, this we're realigning based on trends that provide supporting part-time salaries for the enrollment, right, of our newly arrived students. So we we have spikes in enrollment periods in IAE, right? And the, the one that we're most familiar with is probably the beginning of July through the middle of October. And so we don't have, um, you know, we don't pay for staff to work 12 months a year when we don't have those waves. So we need to set some money aside and we bring in temporary part-time to really make sure that we have no bottlenecks I don't know if you all remember in 2021, we had a lot of noise about the bottlenecks and why is it taking so long? We did a lot of work to iron that out and we were seeing great progress and we really, knock on wood, haven't seen a lot of those complaints. And it's because of how we are strategically bringing in folks um, to expedite that process. That's one of the reasons. Um, we also wanted to make sure out of that money that we're using some, some of those funds to continue our trauma-informed professional learning Right, we know that many. We don't just bring kids in and air quotes move them through the procedure. Right, we have to triangulate around their needs. We have to triage. We have to understand who has been traumatized, what their needs are, and ensure that there is a warm handoff from IE to the schools with our EML therapeutic counselors and so on and so forth. I would also say that Ms. Ms. Bordekas has done an incredible job just this past year launching a professional development series with our principals. We have our principals and our school supervisory directors who have received training about our newcomers and, and what all this work entails. So those are the realignments. And while I have the airtime, I do want to correct something that I think may have been said earlier. Um, I'm going to go back to there was a question about the, the uh, cost potentially could be incurred by the community 
and Magruder for renaming. Um, and I'm not sure what I want to be clear that that the community, the local Magruder community would not um, have to incur these costs, right? We did communicate that through the process. I would say to the credit of the, those in the Magruder community, they did ask because they were concerned about what, what would this cost the district? That was something they factored in. But we are not going to be passing on costs to individual school communities if those renaming of um, projects move forward. OK, I just wanted to make sure that the public was clear on that. Thank you. All right. Well, we are over our time, and I think it makes sense to start another chapter at this point. We've been going at it for almost five hours. So I'm going to um, conclude the meeting today and then ask that we take up the remaining chapters and add them on and adjust the time for the next meeting or, you know, spill it over into the third work session that's being held. That's, we'll figure that out. Um, but I want to thank you for uh, the presentation. These are really important. They're all important. All the chapters are important, but these are really critical uh, student-facing uh, information. And so I appreciate the, the work and look forward to the follow-ups. And uh, thank you, everyone, and um, have a wonderful afternoon. And this concludes our first budget work session.